Hello, everybody. It's Monday once again, and it's Eric Valentine once again. Hey, Eric. Hi. How are you? Hey, Andrew. Hello, everybody. Coming to us from Vermont once again. It looks yep. like it might be a sunny day in Vermont, which it wasn't last time. Yeah, it was probably a snowy day last time. It is It is a beautiful day here in Vermont, man. Nice. May, May is the time. That's the beginning of the golden time in Vermont, for sure. If you're not into skiing, you know, um, this is the time to be here, for sure. Right. It's, it's incredible. Well, I got to say, parts of today here were incredible, but then parts of, like, we have all four seasons all day, every day, it seems now. It's right. It's just ridiculous. And, uh, and I'm sorry, where are you again? Are I'm out you're... in Worcestershire, so about two and right. a half hours west of London. Yeah. Where it wants to rain like nine times a day and then be sunny in between. <laughs> and yeah, but yeah. all good. Now, look, there is um, something from the very beginning of the last part, one bit of this, that you mentioned that all these little uh, acoustic treatments on your walls were like some cheap thing from Amazon. And there were people asking, hold on, what do you got on the walls here? Like you had bass traps that you found on Amazon cheap. Do you remember yes. where they came from? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I could, I, I, I could find it real quick if people are that interested. Yeah. Why don't you yeah. find it? And if you email yeah. I mean, Mark, take, he'll pop it in the chat. Cause yeah, one, it'll take one millisecond for me to. Do you have Mark's email it. or should I, I'll forward it if it's, not. It's a, it's a specific company. I'm sure everybody's heard of it before. And, um, and let's see, I'll, I'll find this thing. It'll take me two seconds. Yeah. Anything that you think everybody's heard of, nobody's heard of it. <laughs> really yeah it's always that way yeah it turns it's, like it's, like with oh. breakfast cereals it turns out you were a test market you know like god right. man i love <laughs> crosby flakes like what yeah and it was you and six other families that had it okay i i believe this is it yeah so it's um once you you want to pop it in the chat of the uh pop it in the zoom chat pop it in the zoom chat so i'll just i'll just put a uh Yep, this is it. Yeah, sixty-six dollars. Good God! For a uh, two foot by four foot four. Oh no, this is a two inch one. Um, so the yeah, so the four inch deep one is going to be a little more expensive than this. But it, it's a company called Acoustamac. All right. Um, so here, let's let me let me get back to to the Zoom thing here. And I don't know if they ship to the UK or not, but if you're in the states, that's an awfully good deal, even if it's only yeah, mediocre. There's no way I could make a panel like that, you know, a wood frame covered with fabric with, you know, some sort of rock wool, mineral wool in there as, uh, as acoustic tre treatment material. I couldn't make it that cheap myself, you know, and so it's, it's amazing that they get this pricing. Okay, now I just have to figure out how to, uh, where's the chat window? Where does that show up? Should be on the side, I think. Yeah, yeah. Let me just make sure I don't hit the leave button. That's going <laughs> to, that'll make for a great interview. Um, I wouldn't take it personally. I'd just assume you'd come okay. back, but maybe you wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Show chat. There we go. Da, da, da. Here we go. So, yeah, I'll, I'll put the link in there. Excellent. So, yeah. Big old Amazon link there. But yeah, that, that company, they make a, a variety of stuff, unbelievably cheap, and it works great. They, they definitely aren't actually bass traps. Um, it's sort of impossible for them to function as that if, you know, you follow this quarter waveform rule where for that type of material, for mineral wool, you, you need a quarter the length of the waveform right. to, be able to actually absorb that waveform with that material. And so, you know, 60 hertz is like a 17-foot waveform. Yeah, so. I mean, Lowy on a bass <laughs> is 40 feet, I think. Yeah. So... <laughs> Yeah, that that four inches ain't gonna do it. No. Not even close. But, but for yeah. for reflections and mid range and stuff, I mean that's yeah. awesome. Tighten up, yeah, tightening up your room, it's awesome. It's amazing. You know, nice. I bought like I don't know, fifteen of them or something. Just put them all over the room, and it feels great in here. So great. Well, thanks for coming. That was all I had for you. Uh, okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> no way. No way. Last last time, we made it just up to the millennium. So okay, right up to two thousand. Yeah, yeah, we got we got right up to two thousand. So we we finished up uh, talking about the uh, about All Star, just the mm -hmm. meteor that was All Star, and how that completely changed your career. And it's obvious because in two thousand, there's an album that came out that I'm I have a feeling we're going to spend about an hour on another Rosie Christmas. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, <laughs> I'd imagine that's not one to spend hours on. Yeah, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> I barely remember it myself, but I do remember it. So this is a Rosie not... O'Donnell All Star Christmassy, you know, or other thing. Yeah, everybody makes a Christmas record at some point. So that was that was Rosie's turn, and she was a big Smash Mouth fan. So. Um, so yeah, we, you know, we, we contribute to that. And there were, I think we ended up doing two songs, one that Rosie herself was involved with. And I had the extraordinary privilege and, you know, somewhat challenging task of editing and mixing Rosie's vocals. Right. <laughs> so, which was very, very interesting. You know, she's, it, she'll tell you herself, she's not a singer. She's you know? not known for that. No. Yeah. And, uh, so that, that was an interesting experience. And, uh, and then Greg, uh, Greg Camp, you know, the, the guitar player and primary songwriter in, in Smash Mouth, he wrote a Christmas song that was amazing. And, um, you know, he's just one of those people. It's, it, as soon as he actually has like a target to aim for, He's unbelievably accurate, you know. It's amazing. You're talking about him just going home because the label said we need a single, and he just came back the next day with All Star. Like, okay, we'll do this yeah. one then. I, yeah. That's incredible. Yeah, he, he's incredible, and uh, you know, I'm hap happy to say we're still friends. We just got together recently in Nashville. I got to see him again. And nice catch up and stuff. And he's an amazing talent, and you know, just one of my favorite people. And is he just writing for people now, or what's he up to? I'm yeah, being he is really ignorant. Um, yeah, I mean, he, I don't know how much he's doing right, right now. Um, you know, like everybody had such a weird year in 2020. And so where that led him and his family, they decided like, you know what, we're kind of just tired of just being in, in Los Angeles. And so they, they decided to just go RV style. So they've been total nomads for the last six months. Wow. So, you know, him, his wife and their two daughters have been, and dog have been, you know, living in an RV, just having a different life experience. And, you know, and I got to catch up with him just to, just a couple of weeks ago and it's been incredible for them, incredible for their family. But I, I don't know that re how much music has been a part of it recently, right. but he's a, he's just an incredibly musical dude. And so that there will always be something going on like that. I'm just not caught up with that part of it. But, right. Um, Right. Well, yeah. fair enough. But look, yeah. so Rosie, you know, I just had to bring it up. Yeah. Comedic <laughs> value. Happened. But yeah. um, but there was also a record that year, uh, Marku Johnson, that you played drums on. And, well, supposedly, according to the internet, do we, is this okay. another crazy, so, like, maybe not thing? This is a really interesting thing. So there are two, you know, identifiable Eric Valentine's uh, uh. in the, in the music world. And um, the other one is an, a, you know, uh, an amazing, incredible, like jazz fusion -y drummer guy. Really? Yeah. And um, he, uh, you know, I, I've been, wa we, I'm sure we've been sort of watching each other as, as we progress. And so, you know, he, a lot of his credits got lumped in with mine on all music. Right. And I believe that's one of them. And, and so I've had this sort of benefit of having all these really incredible <laughs> <laughs> credits floating around in there. And every, every, every once in a while, somebody will ask me something like, did you play the drums on chocolate city grooving? And I'm, no, actually, <laughs> I, I didn't do that. That's this other guy. And he's amazing. We actually finally connected on Facebook and uh, you know, had a good laugh about it but uh, but so that one was not me I okay think. all right because I, I was wondering i mean obviously drummer so do you play because i know you play for yourself still but are you yeah. are you ever looking to play on records are you ever looking to put something together that gives you an opportunity to play or it's just stuff comes up every once in a while yeah i mean the way i approach it is um I, I love to play and I do get to play. I've been able to um, play more drums with Grace at times, you know, when things went kind of haywire and we were stuck at home and we we're still trying to be musical because um, she has a, you know, a selection of amazing drummers that she tours with and records with. And and that's great, you know, um, but when it makes sense and it's convenient for me to do it, I'm happy to do it and I love to do it. And when I've worked on records, 
you know, um, I'm, I'm very, very soft about it because I, I'm always really nervous about being that person as the producer of a record going like, you know, it'd be really great, right, for this how about me playing drums, you know? And it's <laughs> well, like, especially because you're almost always working with artists that have a drummer. Yeah, yeah. And, and most of the time, the drummers are great and everything's great, you know? But um, so I'm, I'm usually very passive about it and, and people have to ask for it, you know, for, for me to play because I don't want to sort of impose myself on things. But, but when I have opportunities to play, I love playing drums, you know? That was really my, my primary, you know, thing in life when when i first got into music was was playing drums and um you know and the opportunities that i've i have had to do it you know more recently i played on um one that i'm really really proud of was uh uh this kid that just put out a few things and this is more recent um his name is spencer lee you can check check out check him out it's called the spencer lee band i played on a song called kissing tree that's just this super like you know, Bill Withers inspired thing. So I got to do my best Man. James Gadsden imitation, which is a tall order. And it was really fun. And it was, you know, a moment, I think an important transition for me where I did the experiment of going through and like really starting to try and line things up more and make things, you know, more, more grid perfect. And, um, and then, compared between what I originally played and the edited version and the original performance was just felt better. It just sounded more engaging to me. And I was, I think I was finally able to listen to it objectively enough to really be able to go like, this is actually better music. You know, it's not me trying to think I'm a great drummer or whatever, or have some sort of, you know, like bias that I'm trying to serve and, and really had a moment where it's like this, this really actually feels better to me. And there are spots in it that are really pretty wonky, you know, like the right. things moving around and there's things that are weird. And I think the human brain, you know, it, I think for certain things, the, the human brain wants to have unexpected things happen. And when things become too repetitive, I think it, it gets boring to, to the human brain. You know? Yeah, yeah. Well, the yeah, we can go down a neurological rabbit hole if you want, but we don't need to do that right now. But yeah. I got to record James Gadsden once, mm -hmm. and we, hit maker. <laughs> we rolled back, and we were listening to the take, and we are sort of checking microphones. So we're soloing some stuff up, and we had the drums soloed during a drum fill. And we're like, what the fuck was that? like? it just sounded like he fell off the stool and took the drums <laughs> with him. Like it was, it was crazy how out of time it sounded. And we rolled back, took it out of solo and listened to it with the band. And it was one of the best feeling things we'd ever heard, but it was so bad on its own. Like you would yeah. never have left it ever. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, I mean, obviously that's James as well. So obviously you're, you're right. channeling a little bit of that, but yeah. it's, um, yeah, and that then you go back and you're like, well, okay, that bit's a little too wonky, and you start having to do this like holistic editing, which can take right. forever. Yeah, you know? yeah, the very selective stuff. Yeah, but yeah, but that it, it's it's cool, and I've you know, and I've really been enjoying going more in that direction. Um, you know, from from that time on, which has really served much much better what I've been doing more recently. Just you know, doing lots of music with with Grace because she's a very in the moment like. I just wanted to feel how it feels and I, perf you know, perfection has never been a part of her thing. It just needs to make you feel something, you know? Yeah. And so it was just an important transition for me, I think along the way to just acknowledge that like there is actually something really better when things are a little bit out of tune and out of time, you know, it's more interesting music. It's, you know, it, it holds your attention better, you know? It's really interesting that it took you being the musician for that to really come across. It's yeah, I I don't know if there was something significant about that or not, but um, uh, but yeah, and I think you know, um, part of I think what I had been getting hired to do a lot um over the years was to help bands, you know, um play make a record that's that's beyond their you know skill set coming into the studio and so i got into a lot of habits you know that were just like 
um, this is the process that I'm going to use right. for f when when I make a record. And, and it was really a process that was really geared more towards a lot of these kind of like, you know, um, kind of loud and fast, punky, poppy kind of things, you know, where people want things, you know, every drum hit to sound like this perfect explosive sample. And, you know, like those those elements are kind of desirable in, in that genre. And I had my own take on it, but you know, there was definitely more more fixing going on in that you know that approach than I would ever consider doing now. You know, I right? Just sort of and moved on. Do you ever think? I mean, obviously, you're getting to to stretch a bit playing with Grace, but did have you ever wanted to put together a music project for yourself to be able to play? Have you ever been tempted to do that? Yeah. And, you know, I've, I've done a fair amount of my own music um, over the years and songs will sometimes get farmed out to, to artists and they've gotten placed with artists at times, you know, um, and the songs always seem to find a home at some point. But there's a, I have a little stash of stuff um, that I've been holding on to that probably aren't they're, they're either just too personal to, to really apply to anybody else or they're, they're things that I'm actually holding on to because they're, I feel like they're that special for something, you know, for something that I wanted to do. And that's part of what's happening right now is this whole transition. We talked about it a little bit before um, going live here that, you know, I'm in the process of selling barefoot recording. And so I've backed away from, you know, the sort of like, you know, um, just back to back grind of just making records with, you know, artists that want to come in and make a record. And so, um, and well, so what I'm, what I'm doing, I'm, I'm, I'm doing the most indulgent thing you could possibly imagine. And I'm, I'm, I'm actually kind of proud of it. Um, so <clears throat> it's really the only thing I didn't do. You know, I've made lots of records with lots of people, very, very grateful for all the opportunities that I've had. And then, and the only thing, that I think I really, the last box that I need to sort of check off for myself for real is like, I want to make an album of my own music and that's what I'm going to do. Right, and so great. I sold Barefoot and um, I'm building the most indulgent recording studio in a barn ever in the history of barn studios. <laughs> so I'm taking all of my favorite stuff out of Barefoot Recording, which was essentially like two and a half recording studios worth of gear that I've accumulated over 30 years and building a studio from scratch in this 8,000 square foot barn. It's gonna be an insane recording studio, really primarily for me to just make my own super indulgent solo record. That's awesome. So this is the solo <laughs> record you're might... finally gonna make after T-Ride, basically. Yeah. Like, <laughs> and it, it could actually be the only thing this studio ever does, which would just be <laughs> totally absurd. But, you know. No, but of, why not, man? Why yeah, not? I'm doing it. I'm doing it. So, no. That's fucking awesome. Well, all right. Look, before we get into some of the bands you were talking about, because I have an idea, a couple of the bands you were talking about, the, one of the next records on my list is a band that you did not need to elevate past their skill set. But we yeah. have to spend some time talking about Queens of the Stone Age. Sure, yeah. yeah. I'd love to know how that came about, first of all, because obviously Josh is a very, like, he's not hiring producers just because. He's very, very, whatever. He thinks about it a lot. So how, yeah. how the project came about and then the project itself. Yeah. Well, we had a lot of um, mutual... Uh, there was a lot of crossover between uh, some projects that that I was working on. I'd, I'd made a couple records for the punk rock band The Dwarves. And um, there's a, a guy named Nick Oliveri, who was the bass player um, in Queens at the time when uh, when I worked with him, also played in The Dwarves. He had um, a name specific for that band. His name in The Dwarves was Rex Everything. And... Uh, <laughs> extremely appropriate for Nick. And, uh, and so, you know, so I'd worked with Nick before and um, there was another guy named Trevor Atkinson or Trevor, whatever um, that was part of the dwarf scene, but was also very much a part of the Queens of the Stone Age scene. Sometimes he toured with Queens either doing tech work or being you know, just um, documenting what they were doing. You know, he was just kind of like part of their group. And uh, so there was a lot of crossover there, and that's how we all kind of knew each other. And, um, you know, I think 
Uh, yeah, well, th no. So this, I think this record was Queen's second album on Interscope, I think. It right. may have been their first. And they were definitely, people were leaning on them, you know, as they do, the powers that be were leaning on on the band to, to hire a producer and hire a sort of like whatever, you know, name producer. And, um, and Josh, at the end of the day, like he really wants to produce those records himself. And, and I think he's very capable of doing it. He has a very, very strong vision for his band and what he wants to do and how to approach things and stuff. Um, and so I think, you know, part of my involvement was really just a matter of convenience that I was friends with everybody that was involved with their scene. And I sort of fulfilled that, you know, role as being a name producer or whatever yeah. um, that the record company was asking for. And, you know, could make all of that work in a way that would hopefully be comfortable for the band and comfortable for the label and, and, and make it happen. And so um, that's really, I think, where it started. And I met with him. We talked about it. And, and uh, he, you know, he did say that there were things about the stuff that I'd done, even though, I mean, it's pretty hard to find any the queens is such a unique band that you wouldn't really be able to go like yeah you know this thing you did for another band is totally like what we want to do like that just doesn't really exist because yeah. they're so unique you know um but he did acknowledge that he could tell that even on like smash mouth records and stuff that there's a, a lot of care and thought that went into designing the guitar sounds and designing sounds for, um, for, for the stuff that I worked on. He thought that that would suit them, you know? And so we, we dove in to do it. And, and so really, you know, um, Josh and I, we were, we were both credited as producers on the record and, and we really did work on it together, sharing, you know, that approach of sharing that task of, you know, realizing the vision in the studio and making it happen and i think i was handling more of the technical side of it and he was probably bringing more of the creative side of it because he really knows what he wants his band to sound like you know and i would jump in at times just to try and help navigate things to sort of stay in the direct you know make sure he's going to get the results that he wants you know um and you know it, it was it was a cool experience you know in some some ways it was really challenging you know like that band is very unique and there's certain choices that are being made be because i think he's so aggressively contrarian like he is so determined to never do anything that anybody else does that it can really limit your options a lot you know <laughs> and yeah. so like he's the guy that's never going to plug you know, a Gibson Les Paul into a Marshall that right. will never, ever happen with him ever, <laughs> you know, because it's a tried and true thing. It sounds great. Everybody's done it. And he's like, that's exactly what I'm not going to do. And right. so like, you know, one of the first things that we did on that project, we went to black market music. You remember black market? Oh music? yeah. 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 I mean, it was like a graveyard for, you know, musical instruments and, you know, uh, amps and gear and stuff and so like half of the stuff in there was broken and you know whatever it was just like piles and piles of all this stuff and he just we, we went in there and just bought like all of the crappiest stuff we could find it was like old you know transistor based pv amplifiers and stuff it's like we want to use you know the weirdest most unexpected stuff possible i think we, he was referencing greg ginn you know from um uh uh, the punk band uh, Black Flag, I think. Oh, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. That plays uh, all transistor-based amps, you know? And um, and so, you know, so then I'm sort of, like, thrown the task of, like, okay, we're going to plug into all these, like, crappy fucking PV amps. Let's try and make them sound cool, you know? <laughs> and it was not easy. It was really fucking hard at times. You know, there was... I, I have some pictures of, of from those sessions and me just, like, putting every mic I have, every version of every mic I possibly can find on one of these cabinets with one of these amps, you know, trying to figure out something that is going to add up with this guitar sound that's going to make it translate in a cool way, you know? And so there's things about it that were really, really tough. And there's things about it that were really fun and really rewarding. Um, you know, it's because it, there's a, a lot of very cool creativity. I think, you know, the irreverence and the the attitude of, of like, you know, were one of the things that I really liked about his approach um, that was discussed along the way was like, 
you know, once you put records out, a band, you know, you have, you start to develop a legacy of, of like what people expect from you. And that's even more of an issue now because everybody gets to express their opinion about your fucking music on the internet, you know? Right. And, you know, back then in 2000, that wasn't really as much of a thing, but even then, you know, like you would hear bits and pieces of feedback from people of what they think is cool or not, or what you should or shouldn't do. And, and Josh's attitude was always straight up, just like, fuck the fans. Like they're not here to tell me what kind of music to play. I'm here to make cool music and present it to them. And that's the way this works. Thank you very much. You know, <laughs> like he was super, super clear about that. <laughs> and, and I think it's, I think I like that. I mean, I, I like that sort of, you know, sense of ownership of your own creativity. It's like, I'm the one that spent the time designing this band sound and all of this shit. And I know what's going to be cool to do or not do. You, nobody else needs to tell me that. Right. You know? And, and I think he was right. It's cool. You know, that band is fiercely original and super brave and you know, how, how he approaches things. And, you know, uh, it was a really cool project to be a part of, you know, and they still have plenty of fans. They do, yeah. Whether whether he ignores them or not, they they keep coming back. Yeah, you know? I mean, look, I think that's just the harsh version of what you would tell a band who's leaning too far in the other direction, which is that you can't ever make a decision on a record based on what you think someone else thinks. Yeah, ever. Yeah. So doesn't work. Josh is just doing that with a you know a finger up. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And, you know, the, the other, I've talked about this before a little bit on, on my channel and, and in interviews and stuff. The other thing is challenging is like, you know, that band at that time and, you know, they, they wear it on their sleeve. It's in their songs. You know, if you hear, listen to feel good hit of the summer on a previous record of theirs, like those dudes do a lot of drugs or they did at that time. And it was crazy. It was by far the most drugs I've ever seen in any, creative environment ever like every night descended into just complete incoherence i mean it was <laughs> unbelievable what would happen every day and there was a point where you know i realized like we're we're never going to finish like we're just not going to be able to finish this record if we don't get out of la you know there was just too many people that were available that could come over and facilitate continuing that thing and participating in in that whole part of it you know and so um, and it's funny, I, you know, I had a conversation with Josh more recently and we both remember that moment in opposite ways. Like <laughs> I'm very clear that I was the one that initiated the move out of <laughs> LA. <laughs> I, I, I feel very confident about that. And, uh, when I talked to him, he said that it was his idea to do it, to get me out of my studio to try and shake things up because we were recording at barefoot, you know, right. a place where I've got all my sort of routines and all of my huggy blanket shit, you know, and he wanted to try and change things up and just, you know, change the energy of the project and, and go to another place. And so maybe, maybe we both wanted to go somewhere else, but um, we ended up going to this place called the site in up in Marin. Do you, you know that studio? I know of it. Yeah. I never went. Never yeah. Uh, it's an amazing place. You know, it's one of these like compound recording studios where they have, you know, these cabins that you can stay in. It's a beautiful studio out in the woods. There's no cell reception. It's like, there's nothing to do but make a record. And nobody's driving out there to go and fucking get high. Like, that's just not going to happen. You know, is that where Jakir did the Tom Waits record? I think it is. I think that's what he was. No, that about. that was Prairie Sun. Oh, Prairie Sun. Right. Sorry. Yeah. Different, More cabins with nothing but, else around. But yeah, a very similar. Yeah. setup. But, um, you know, and, it, and it, I think it worked out well. We ended up being able to finishing, you know, all the remaining overdubs in a couple of weeks instead of three months, you know, which is right. what it was looking like it was going to take, you know, and yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, it was, it was a cool record. We did a bunch of crazy stuff on that record. You know, we had Dave Grohl ended up playing drums on the whole record. And, yeah. um, you know, and, and Josh was really committed to this thing of like, I hate cymbals. I just, I, you know, I want to be able to turn them down as far as I want. So we're just going to record the cymbals separate from the drums, you know? Yeah. And, um, and you know, it was, it was convenient when it was t time to mix. Um, and that was great. But like, there's times, you know, when that, band was playing the way that thing got tracked is like sort of a last minute decision to, ha to have Dave end up playing on the whole record. And so he just showed up and we had two rooms set up. I have 
two studios at Barefoot. And so they were set up to rehearse in Studio B and we were set up to record in Studio A. And so they would, I would set up the miking and tune the drums and get everything set up to record a particular song. And while I was doing that setup, they'd be rehearsing that song. And then they would come in the room and play the song. And a lot of them had, you know, very sort of jammy improvised sections in it where Dave is like doing all these crazy drum fills and stuff, just playing off the top of his head. You know, it wasn't like this carefully mapped out composed things. And then we'd finish that song. They'd go and start rehearsing the next song while I change things around with the drums or whatever and setups. And then we do the next one. And then after we did all of that, you know, for like days of doing that, then it was like, okay, now we're going to play all the cymbals. And so he'd come back, you know, to the, the song that he had recorded, you know, four days ago with all these random crazy drum fills and trying to figure out how to play the cymbals to it, you know. And there was, yeah. So he's moments. tracking with no cymbals when you're doing the jam, like after yeah, the rehearsal. Yeah. What I ended up doing was I got a set of um, electronic drum cymbal pads. Right. And so he would have something to hit and hear something in his ears and those those tracks are still on the masters it's really funny you can pull them up and it's you know there's these sections where he's like crash writing and it sounds like bee, 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 you know this stupid cymbal sample being hit over and over again but it actually made it much more playable um yeah. so you don't have this thing of like the downbeat you know comes around do 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 dot and there's no cymbal sound you know right. like it's so disorienting when you're actually trying to feel your way through a song and um and so it, I, that part of it worked out really well. And, and Dave is like, he has like an unbreakable energy and spirit for playing drums. You know, have you ever recorded with him? No, you, no, I haven't. And like, it's, I mean, he's just incredible in, in the room. He elevates everybody in the room because he's just so excited to be there playing and doing stuff and like, whatever, you know, he's just an incredibly energetic, cool dude. And it was the only time I've ever seen him at a moment just be like, whose fucking idea was this? <laughs> like, this is fucking stupid, you know, where it finally kind of broke him. And I sort of discreetly made the transition to because that whole record was being recorded directly to tape, by the way. Right. <laughs> and so I'm trying to punch in his symbols on an Ampex MM1200 16 track. <laughs> oh, good God. <laughs> and so you know and and so I, I i made that transition so we were recording them on the computer so i could at least punch in and out wherever i needed to and slide some things around because you know it becomes a lot more difficult for the drum feel to be to sound connected to itself you know because it's his hand, you know, one of his hands is sort of drifting in time from the rest of the drum kit. And it's one thing to have the whole drum set sort of moving. Yeah, and breathing, of course. You know, in tempo. But when it's drifting outside of itself, it's weird. It, it loses its focus, you know. Yeah. And um, and so I, I went back and, and did some editing without anybody really knowing on that one. And, it, and that was not like, it wasn't about trying to make it on a grid. It was about trying to make it so he actually really, you know, so. Well, you had where he had actually hit the symbol the first time around to look at too. So, I mean, that, that must have yeah. helped. But yeah, it's, and that proliferated. Like there was an article about it and that exploded. And every band recorded that way for a while. And right. it's <laughs> like the worst thing ever. Yeah, it, it's. Yeah. And I'd imagine like if Dave could have overdubbed his cymbals like right after, it might have been a little bit easier because he was still in the moment. He'd remember a lot of the fills he played or whatever. But right. even so, there's always something like you're talking about that weird disconnect. And then sonically, you'd think like, great, I can do anything I want to the cymbals, but there's always something missing. There's like a hole yeah. in it, which is yeah. weird. Yeah, I think, that, you know, I've learned that, you know, the the cymbal bleed or hi-hat bleed that you get in the snare drum mic becomes a cool part of the sound, you know? And it's and it pumps with whatever compression you've got on the snare because mm. the snare's going at the same time. It's not the same yeah. as just having an open snare mic and recording yeah. that bleed. So, yeah, so it's not your fault. It's Josh's fault, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, you you can tell him. It, it, no, 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 no. <laughs> Go and try to explain to him how. No, man, he's is. a big dude. I'm not, I'm not explaining <laughs> anything to him. Okay. But I mean, you know, if any drummer is going to be able to pull it off, Dave, like, you know, a drummer yeah. of that caliber can pull it off. But 
it's I think it's just a huge mistake to try to sort of unravel whatever musicality the drummer actually has for the sake of like a sonic thing. Yeah, yeah, I, I've always felt the same way. It's like I, I it's my job to cater to making getting the best performance, you know, like, you know, really making creating a context and environment and a workflow that's going to allow people to play the very, very best they can. And like, man, that that is a challenging thing to do. And it, it was interesting. One of the other things that happened in the wake of that record was um, when, when it ultimately came out, um, you know, you, you start hearing about comments and feedback and stuff because, yeah, I guess there really was some of that going on then. And um, uh, people were, you know, going like, oh, man, they use drum samples with Queen. That's so lame and blah, blah, blah. And everybody's blaming me, you know, like <laughs> that fucking asshole, you know, he's so lame <laughs> putting drum samples on Queens of the Stone Age, you know. And I didn't put a single fucking drum sample on there, you know, like that. It's not on that fucking record. Um, you know, I don't I mean, I'm not I can't be 100 percent sure because I didn't mix it, but I know I can hear it those are my drum recordings, you know, on that record, there's no samples on there. Yeah. And, um, and, it, you know, and there are times where it does feel like that because, um, for starters, Dave Grohl is the most inhumanly consistent yeah. hitting drummer I've ever experienced in my life. He just like, he plays like a fucking freight train, you know, and every hit is exactly the same. And he plays unbelievably hard. Like, you know, I grew up playing rock drums, and I'm not the, you know, biggest, most muscular human being in the world, but I learned how to hit drums hard when I grew up playing drums. And most often I end up playing harder than I probably should. And I've learned to play soft now later in my life and realize like, oh, <laughs> that's, that's how you get drums to sound good, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, um, uh, and so like I would check his drum levels before he'd sit down to play him. I'd move some mics around and whatever and play as hard as I possibly could. And then he would sit down and everything would still redline yeah. after I was playing as hard as I could. It was insane. And, you know, most people, uh, the drum sound totally collapses when you play that hard. But because he does it so consistently, it works for him. Every hit is just exactly the same. Um, and so that was part of it sounding kind of sample-ish, I suppose. And, and I think the symbols being separated out of it also contributed to that. And also because you're a really, really good engineer and get really, really good drum sounds that are better than a lot of the drum sounds most people get. And people assume it's got to be samples, even yeah, though maybe, somebody yeah. had to make the damn samples in the first place. But Right, yeah. So, yeah. So, <laughs> there, there are people that have known how to mic drums, apparently. Yeah, I mean, you know, we we did some really unique stuff on that record. There's, um, I, I didn't close mic the toms at all. There was basically, you know, um, a mic on the kick drum, a mic on the snare drum, and then there was like a left drum kit mic, a center drum kit mic, and a right drum kit mic that was picking up, you know, sort of like the the air of the snare drum and the rack tom, and then there was a mic sort of in the middle that was getting sort of a mono picture of the drum kit sort of focused on the snare drum and then a mic over here that was getting a floor tom or floor toms um that was getting the left the, the right side of the kit and i didn't have to worry about any cymbal bleed because there's no cymbals you know right and so then you don't have to listen to the sound of a tom with a mic one inch you know from the head which is just a ridiculous absurd stupid sound that i hate you know and so um the, i i really enjoyed that luxury you know of being able to do that so there was sort of that layer of this, you know, um, left, center, right overhead mics. And then there was a pair of um, C37As that were room mics in this drum booth. And so most of the stuff on that record was done in this drum booth, all the really tight, punchy stuff like the song No One Knows or uh, Go With The Flow or Give It Away or, yeah, um, It Giveth something. Yeah, I can't remember the song title. Something Giveth. Um, yes, yeah, so all those songs were the drum booth ones. We did a couple out in the bigger room, um, but even that, we we put up a lot of absorptive stuff in the room just to keep it everything just kind of tighter and more focused sounding. And when you don't have the cymbals, it is pretty cool to be able to turn up 
those room mics as loud as you want. You can yeah. have as much of it as you want. And the drums in the booth had a really cool quality where they're they're punchy and they're focused, but you can you can feel the space that they're in. But it's like this really kind of claustrophobic space because it's in a drum booth, you know, and it's kind of a unique drum booth. The, you know, the the footprint of it is relatively small, I would say, you know, roughly it's an odd shape, but it's roughly maybe 10 by 10. But it has a very big, very tall ceiling. It's got a 16 foot ceiling. And so um so it was, it's just a cool sound, you know. Uh, I had been using it you know, before um, they came in. And, and Josh, in the past, he had always built these drum forts where he'd put, like, curtains and blankets and stuff, right. stuff around the drums to try and tighten them up. And I was like, fuck, fuck the fort. Let's just put them in, the, in this drum booth. And, uh, you know, it just worked out really well for, um, for those really p tight, punchy songs, you know, on that stuff. And we wanted to make a a record that was just like inescapably in your face you know yeah well mission accomplished because yeah. it's a and it's a great record and i think it really they leveled up you know i think interscope got what they wanted out of that they definitely was a lot more mainstream for as mainstream as they're ever going to get it reached a lot more people and i think it, it sort of it took them out of the desert and established them as like fuck man this band's going to be around you know right right yeah not just jamming and that was actually one of the things that um that i feel like was my voice in the room that was part of you know my contribution to production was whenever whenever it came up and when, whenever there was an option to you know i would be the voice in the room of like i don't know that we need to do that for 16 bars you know and try to like just distill it down a little bit more you know on the previous record there would be sections where it's just they're great grooves and riffs but you know it's like really we're doing we're gonna do this for you know like <laughs> it's like oh here comes the phone oh no not not yet, not yet. <laughs> okay wait you know no, and it's oh, kind of no. cool it's i mean it's like got this cool hypnotic effect and when you finally the change happens and may, maybe it's more eventful but you know i thought it was cool to try and distill things a little bit you know yeah and so um and so yeah i, I you know hopefully that was that was a, a positive part of their evolution well i mean i'd say it stuck with them too because i mean they're they're not stretching out as much as they did on the earlier records it's more i mean it's not like they're writing pop songs but yeah. they're well kind of are you know there's like yeah, real know. structure and stuff so yeah but it's a fucking great record yeah, it's a cool record. I'm, I'm very, very grateful that I was asked to be a part of it, and um, and very proud of the bit that I contributed to it. You know, I, I it really sounds like barefoot. You know, that studio, which is is about to go away. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know. Well, hopefully, and, live uh, on in a different incarnation or whatever. Yeah. But I'm actually, you know, I'll, I'll give a little tip off to everybody here. I'm, you know, I'm flying to L.A. tomorrow. Um, to go and start packing up every single thing in that building. I'm going to take everything out of that building. And the last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to film two episodes for my YouTube channel. Great. One of those episodes is going to be about that drum recording that we just discussed. Fantastic. So I'm, I'm going to reset it up because it was all my gear. It was my drums, my microphones, my everything. Uh, and so I'm going to do that, and then I'm going to do the drum recording approach that I used for all of the sort of like bigger rock sounding records. Great. Third Eye Blind, Taking Back Sunday, Good Charlotte, like this sort of big rock thing. And so, because a lot of that was done in the big room at Barefoot. And so this is my last opportunity, really for real, to actually like document how that was done. So that's going to happen. And at some point, I've been super, super neglectful to my YouTube channel lately because I, I just, life has been insane you're busy you know? well and good on you for for filming that stuff because it'd be very easy to not do it it's yeah you know i'm doing it but now I'm you've said it. it out loud so now i have to do it me and four thousand <laughs> other people are going to hold you to it yeah yeah that's great um so whose decision was it for you not to mix the record and were, were you cool with that was that always the way it was going to yeah. be or yeah i was totally cool with that it, that was always part of the discussion you know right out of the gate and and so you know he had um ideas of people that he wanted to work with at the time and i'm always happy to contribute in whatever way people feel will be best for me to be involved you know and so 
um, you know, I suppose there's a limit to that. You know, I'm not going to um, show up and be get tea for somebody on a, on a project. But, um, you know, uh, I, if if yeah, if they want somebody else to mix and it's a project that I'm super excited about and want to be involved with, then totally that's it's completely fine. You know, and so, you know, towards the end of the project, this the scheduling started getting weird where, you know, this was a thing that just started dragging on forever. And, you know, like I mentioned, we went to another studio to try and speed up the process and get it done in time. And I started to run into another project that I was committed to. And so um, it really, when we got there, it really made sense for him to uh, take the project somewhere else and, and finish mixing it. Um, it worked out better because he, he took off to do a bunch of touring in Europe with Masters of Reality, a project that he did with, uh, with Chris I think it was Chris Goss. Yeah. And, um, and so there was like another like month and a half of like, okay, now <laughs> what? We, I'm just waiting here to finish this thing, you know? And so, um, so yeah, it, it, it worked out great. Right. And, um, and it was Adam Casper that came into mix, um, who was friends with Dave, Dave Grohl. Um, they had been, they had worked together on a bunch of stuff. And so I think Dave suggested him and he did a great job. So yeah. Awesome. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Nice. Um, so, you mentioned Taking Back Sunday and Good Charlotte. And mm -hmm. I think we we could just talk about them now because they're sort of right around, they're just after, basically. Yeah, I think Good Charlotte was the project after Queens. Right. I think, yeah. So you yeah, tracked the, the symbols at the same time, I'd imagine. I did, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did. Um, yeah, and so that one, um, you know, there's been a sort of a, a series of bands that, that will call me for one specific reason. And it's because I recorded the first Third Eye Blind record. <laughs> and so Good Charlotte was another one of those bands. They're like, we want to sound like that first Good Charlotte or that first uh, Third Eye Blind record. And um, and so, you know, I did that same approach, uh, rec recording that record. Um, so we recorded it all to tape, directly to analog tape. And, um, uh, yeah, and I used the, the, just the same miking approaches and everything for the drums and all of that stuff. You know, that's, that's what we went for. And, you know, I think that drum miking approach was just a thing that had sort of evolved um, for me, you know, just years of recording bands in Northern California in the studio that I had up there. And ultimately, it had sort of, you know, evolved to the point where it got documented on the Third Eye Blind record. And then, you know, I was able to pull it back out of my hat, you know, on subsequent records down the road, you know, it, it came up for Good Charlotte, it came up for Taking Back Sunday, it came up for, you know, All American Rejects, there was just, you know, a series of bands after they were like, how did you do that one, you know? Um, and so we did that, that uh, the Good Charlotte record was interesting because they, they were having a drummer transition on that record. Um, the, the original drummer in the band was like a, you know, a high school buddy of theirs and they had a falling out with him and parted ways and then they found a drummer quickly to sort of finish the touring um off of that record which i think i think i'm it was their yeah so they had made one record and i was making their second record which was the the young and hopeless record and um and so they had a guy that was a, a really a great guy that they you know hired sort of um in a pinch to, to finish out touring because they had this falling out and um and felt you know became felt really loyal to him and wanted to have him play on the record and so you know when they were talking about doing this like third eye blind style and it's like we're you know we're recording to tape machines um and so there's no there's no fix button, you know, like that's it. That's all you get. You know, it goes on there and it stays exactly the way it goes on, you know? And, and I think, you know, the previous record they, that they had made was done in pro tools. And so I, I, I don't, people just don't really understand the reality of that. Yeah. If they've never recorded on tape before, they don't really get Especially it. if you're going to leave it on tape. Yeah. 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 And that's, that's how the third eye blind record was done. And, and that's ultimately how we did the Good Charlotte record. And so we did a round of pre-production with the, the drummer that they had been playing with on tour. And I knew for sure that he wasn't up to the task. It wasn't going to happen. And, um, and it's the, the absolute shittiest part of, of being a producer, for sure, is having to tell somebody, 
this is not going to work, you know? And it was a complete bummer for everybody. They were fucking horrified. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I was actually sitting there telling them we're going to have to hire somebody to play drums, you know? And, uh, and so, you know, once we emotionally recovered from that, we called Josh freeze and, uh, <laughs> there you go. Uh, and then they got really excited about that. Actually, they they were fans of a lot of stuff that he had played on. And so we had Josh come in and play on half of the record. And then we had this other guy that I just become aware of, um, just before this, uh, because he was playing with, uh, the dwarves and, um, was an am amazing drummer, just an un undiscovered gem uh, of a drummer. And I knew that this guy was definitely capable of, you know, putting performances on tape machines. So, um, and so they split, split tasks, you know, um, and some of the stuff I had, I tracked with both drummers. And so we could just, we, who, whichever one came out, you know, felt the best, we would do it. And they both had great versions. And, and so uh, I got to sort of, you know, pick my favorite. And um, and it worked out great. You know, they had a, a healthy budget to make the record. And so we could definitely afford to do it. And um, uh, and so we were able to get through through tracking the basics on that. And, you know, and I set them up. So it was like, you know, drums, bass, um, two guitar players like we're going to all play this together as a band. Here we go. Let's do it. You know, and um, and the, the process with that is like, you know, you get the best possible overall takes on tape. And then I distill it down to the best sections of songs by editing with a razor blade. And then from there we would do punches. And so, um, I would punch the bass stuff, you know, if there was a couple of bass mistakes here or there, punch those in. And then whatever the guitars that were going live, I'd try and fix those up. And there were times where, um, if we couldn't get the perfect guitar sound or whatever, we would save it as an overdub and just have a scratch track for the guitar while we were tracking drums. You know, if it was hanging things up just to keep the momentum going, like, okay, we won't, you know, obsess over this. Now we'll have, we'll be able to really focus on it as an overdub and we'll, and we'll get it later. But I would say, you know, half the stuff we were able to sort of tidy up those, those live guitar and bass tracks and keep those and then overdub whatever additional guitar doubles and things later on in the overdub thing. And, um, got through that whole process and uh, and then got into the overdub phase. And, you know, with this process, I was doing the same thing. Although this, I knew there was going to be a lot of tracks. And so it was two 24 track reels. I typically did a 16 track master for drums and bass and a rhythm guitar. That's what the third eye blind album was. Um, and then a 24 track slave reel where, you know, you bounce, do like a stereo drum mix and have the bass and the one guitar on the first two tracks. Yeah. And then you've got, you know, another 20 tracks available to do vocals and additional overdubs and whatever crap you want to put on there. And so, um, so we're doing that and there's, there's some interesting moments, you know, like I mentioned that, um, you know, they had made their previous record with, with Don Gilmore, who's a great, you know, amazing record maker. And, um, and he had a real system for how he did stuff. You know, he was set up in a place and, um, uh, and they recorded stuff to into the computer. He had already made that transition was just cranking away with it, you know? And so that was their, their only other, you know, record making experience was with Don. And, and so when we got, got into doing some of these overdubs and stuff and we're recording stuff onto a tape machine and I'm going like, nope, there's a lot of time. Nope, out of tune. Let's tune the guitar again. Nope, uh, nope. That uh, came a little early there. No, nope, it pulled that one chord out of tune a little bit. You know, like over and over and over and over again. And it was like, it just, you could just see it just wash over their faces at a certain point. It's like, this is really hard. Like, this is, <laughs> wait a minute. Like, what's going on? And then they explained like what, what it was like on the last record where Don had them in a booth you know, like t out of the control room, totally separate in their own place, you know, with these headphones on. And um, he'd say, you know, okay, uh, go ahead and play, uh, play the guitar part. And he'd let him play through it. And he's like, cool. Yeah. We'll try that one more time. Just play through it one more time. All right, cool. Got it. Right. And that was it. Yeah. You know? I mean, the joke in that era was, yeah, that sucked. Come on in. Like, yes. Yeah. And who knows what happened after that? You know, like, I don't know, but uh, you could tell 
that for them, something did not add up. <laughs> something was like, wait a minute. Like, there's no way it was that easy la last time, and it's this hard this time. Right. That something is but it was, so that was the first time it occurred to them that they might have had their stuff edited, like, to hell. Possibly edited, possibly replayed. replayed. I, yeah. I, I don't know, but, you know, the, you know, there was just, there was a disconnect there that was impossible, you know, to reconcile. Um, but ultimately they were committed to it and they fucking stepped up to it and they worked their asses off and they played great on that record. And they let me torture them with playing it over and over again. And I helped them, you know, really learn how to deliver performances that sound and feel great when they come out of the speakers. You right. Know? And, and what, you know, what it really means to commit to that and not just go, eh, you know, whatever, close right. enough. Or, yeah. Let's actually just get better at doing this and make it great. You know, and it was really for me, it was kind of a holdover from all the way back to the, the, the approach that I took with T-Ride because there were so many rounds of this in, in the T-Ride project where there were things that we would conceptualize for a song, a guitar part that we wanted that we either programmed with a synthesizer, with a sequencer, a MIDI sequencer. It's like we want to have these notes played like this on guitar. But nobody knew how to play it. And now we just have, we have to figure it out, you know? And, and I just learned that it was, if you really want something, you, nine times out of 10, 99 times out of 10, it's just a matter of taking the time to figure it out and do it. And if you can't do it the first time, doesn't mean you ain't going to get it. You right. Know? Just fucking practice it and try it again and figure out another way to do it and try something else and do this and figure out how to make it work, you know, and you will get there. If you put the time and energy and focus and invest yourself in it, you will fucking get there. And, you know, I think people are, there's a real, you know, um, I think dirty secret about record making and how it gets portrayed either in movies or in documentaries about records you know i think bands there's a vanity there where bands want to come across as being really virtuosic and gifted and they're going to only show the parts of them being amazing and virtuosic and you don't see the hours of practice and the times where they got it wrong and it sucks and they didn't like it and it's out of tune and you don't see that part right but that shit's there you know um, if it's really, really great, I bet you it's there. And the, you know, the the musicians that are really notably extraordinary are also infamous for practicing relentlessly, yeah. you know, just always playing their instruments. You look at a person like Jimi Hendrix, everybody says he never, ever didn't have a guitar in his hands. Yeah. He was just always playing guitar. He always had it in his hands. He was always playing it when he's walking around, when he's sitting in the lounge, when he's doing something else, when he's tracking, when he's playing, when he's rehearsing. He always had a fucking guitar in his hands. That's why he was an amazing guitar player, you know? And so I I I just think it can't be overemphasized, you know, that like it's if you put in the work, you'll get there, you know? And so I think that was one of the things that um was really revealed for them in that process that it, there was a moment at the beginning that really felt like this is impossible i'm never going to be able to play this i can't believe this guy is telling me that it's still not right but then we would get there and they started to get used to that that cycle they're like yeah it's going to be hard for a second but it's going to get there and when we do it's going to be great you know and we'll be happy that we did yeah it's cool it's cool to watch that happen and yeah. i think it, it also though like yeah anybody can work really hard but it's the ability to see where it has to go to have that destination that's mm -hmm. the that's the talent that's the artistic part of it right. whether it's the band or you or whatever but to know when you do have it yeah yeah and whatever that goal of excellence is and in any artistic endeavor it becomes very subjective right so there's lots of different versions of excellence but being you know once and it's one of the things that i think that i seek out in in people that i that i work with is like i think once somebody becomes an expert at a particular thing whatever it is you you learn what it takes to be an expert you know and how you reach a threshold like that and it's it's a unique thing and that once you understand what expertise is at something you can apply it to other things and 
then, and it's just a matter of then committing the time to it and you will achieve the same level of excellence. And like what you're saying, knowing what excellent is can be the hardest part, you know? And, and yeah, and it's like anybody that's gone through that process and achieved it in one particular thing, it makes it easier to achieve it in another particular thing because they just, they know how to identify it better. Right. You know? Now, I'm sure the chat has been blowing up about this. So you need to, I hate doing geeky things while we're in the middle of this, but you've got to talk about what this drum approach is for the recording. Okay, sure. So now we're talking about the big rock thing that was used on Third Eye Blind, yeah. and Charlotte, and Taking That Sunday, and All American Radio. Okay. Yeah, just um, just real quick, just to run through it. So because sure. otherwise it's going to be question one, two, and three once we get to the Q and A. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so it's a lot of microphones. So I would use fourteen tracks um, for this. That's and... not a lot. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> now I'm using one track for drums. Right. So it's, uh, it's it's a lot by my current standard. Um, I see. I was going to try and take some notes while I do this, but so uh, there would be count. multiple, um, yeah, multiple kick sources. So there's um, a main kick microphone, and so that would typically be like a 47 FET, or sometimes I'd use a 421 if I wanted something a little more aggressive. Um, sometimes it was an ATM 25. Um, so one of those types of microphones that would get sort of like the main drum, kick drum, you know, sound that's on the resonant side of the drum, you know, not on the batter side of the drum. And um, uh, there was even a time where I was blending two microphones. I was putting the, the ATM 25 inside a hole in the head, and then I was putting the 47 FET um, on the actual resonant head. I would blend those two together, put them on one track. There's my kick thing, right? Um, so that's track number one. So then there, there was a low endy thing that I came up with, which was a lot of people were doing this NS10 speaker thing. And um, I tried the speaker by itself outside of the enclosure, and I found it to be just kind of too subby and ringy and weird yeah. and sort of unsatisfying, uh, just kind of too tonal. And, uh, and so I, I ended up trying one just out of pure laziness. Um, the uh doing the ns10 in the box and it's incredibly punchy and cool sounding <laughs> and so um and so I, what i ended up doing is blending the two together and so you take an ns10 speaker outside of the box and one that's left in the enclosure and you you know wire a, an xlr connector onto both of those and bring them up on the console you have to flip the phase on one of them and they add up in an amazing way and so you get this amazing like 80 hertz punch from the one that's in the box and then like an octave lower this 40 hertz resonance that you can blend in as a subby thing it's just perfect kick drum low end that you just put on a track and you can blend it in with the other mic then there's another kick drum source which is the batter side of the kick drum. And so it was originally uh, a U87 that was underneath the snare drum in cardioid pointed at um, the batter side of the kick drum to the left of the kick pedal. So, you know, so if the kick pedal's here, uh, it looks backwards on the screen, but yeah, looks right yeah. to me. Um, uh, and so just pointing at the head, just an 87 sort of sideways pointing at the head. And uh, that I, I really liked the sound of that for a while. And then I started experimenting with some other things. I have these little um, Sony ECM50 lapel mics. Yeah, and so they're great. Those. Yeah, aren't they? Those are awesome. I actually use them for my YouTube channel. <laughs> right. I use them in acoustic yeah. guitars all the time because you can hang yeah. them in the hole behind the strings and there's no right. bleed even in a room with drums. Yeah, great, great microphone. Um, and so that I would just hang over the the top edge of the the rim of the kick drum pointing down at where the beater you know uh hits the head on the batter side of the kick drum so that's track number three yeah and so then there would be a, a mono room mic that's positioned specifically just to capture a cool room sound for the kick drum and so i'd fish around the room wherever i was to find a spot that just has a lot of cool buildup of low end for the kick drum um, maybe put up some baffles to try and minimize the symbols getting into it, stuff like that. So that would be track number four. And that was so generally would, pretty low in the room physically or not necessarily? Yeah, maybe only a foot or two off the ground, right. keep it kind of low. I'd explore the corners of the room, you know, try and find places where there's a lot of low-end energy. 
Um, and, you know, so those four tracks would ultimately make the kick drum sound. And, um, and so I could, you know, uh, high pass them in different ways and sort of, you know, um, split off what frequencies are being covered by what microphones and you end up having more control over how the attack is being compressed versus the low end being compressed and all that stuff. And so with that, I always knew that I would be able to make the kick drum happen for all the different dynamics, the different sections of the song, however they're playing, whatever, I'd get something cool. Um, so then snare drum mic. And so there would be either um, a 57 um, on the snare drum. I was always, it's always just worked great for me. It's easy, sounds cool, um, bright, aggressive, you know, in your face snare drum sound. Uh, on the Third Eye Blind record, I was blending together a 57 and a U67 um, on the snare drum, believe it or not. And this, the, the 67 was always kind of on the brink of, you know, clipping and stuff. Yeah. Um, but it was kind of a cool part of the sound. It just sounded like the, you know, snare drum was exploding. And then a, a mic on the bottom of the snare as well. And so bottom mic was a lot of times I have a Neumann U64, which is just like a, a you know, a small, di you know, condenser, small diaphragm condenser mic. Um, and so those three mics would get blended together and put on track five. Okay. And then track six would be just a mono drum kit mic that is just trying to pick up the overall picture. And this was invariably third eye blind, all these records, Cole's 4038. Amazing for that position. Cause it would, I would sort of position it um, in between the, the symbols that are sort of spread out on each side of the drum kit and try and position it in between the rack tom and the floor tom. So it gets an equal amount of those two guys and point it at the snare drum and it would get like this cool, more natural sound of the kick drum and natural sound of the toms and all that stuff. Um, so that's track number six. The important part of this layout is paying attention to your odd and even tracks, right? So when you get into stereo pairs, they can be odd even. And so that's where we are now. So right. seven and eight would be overheads left and right. Um, so that was a uh, pair of C12s. I rented C12s from um, this uh, wonderful guy, Stephen Jarvis, had a equipment rental company up in Northern California, had an amazing pair of C12s that were just beautiful for drum overheads, just huge sounding, you know? And so I like more of a, um, I'll bring my hands down here, uh, more of an XY kind of approach. So the, the mics would come in like this and be close together with them pointing out right. to the edge of the kit instead of having them far apart looking in. Um, I've always liked having the mics closer in looking out because then their phase correlation for the low end is, is much, much tighter. Um, and, you know, and you can aim them out as much as you need to, to get a, a wide stereo field, but then, you know, all of the, all of the resonance of the drums are all in phase because they're right next to each other. Um, so that's seven and eight, nine and 10 is the toms. Um, so there would be, you know, a, a rack tom mic. And then um, most of the drummers I was working with were just a rack tom, a floor tom. Sometimes there would be two floor toms. When there's two floor toms, I'd put the floor tom mic between the two. Um, and I'd always have a bottom mic for the floor toms. Didn't need it for the rack tom, but it's great on the floor toms. I use my C12As um, on right. toms. Incredible tom mics. Um, so that would be toms um, for tracks 9 and 10. And so then... I would have um, 11 and 12 would be room mics. Um, and so those would be like, uh, a lot of times I'd point them away from the drums. So it's very diffused sounding. Sometimes it even put baffles in between the drums and the mics, just depending on the size of the room to get the most dif diffused, you know, um, uh, room sound I possibly can. Uh, and so that was sometimes 87s were really great um, when I was really being super indulgent, you know, at uh, Skywalker Sound. They had M50s. I'd use those. Um, I've had uh, what else has been good for those? Um, uh, there's there's one song when we were at the studio called Toast in San Francisco. Um, 
the song Graduate. Um, I experimented with a bunch of stuff, and none of the, the condenser mics were really sounding cool in the room, which is sort of a medium to small size room at Toast. And so I ended up putting up baffles between the drums and the mics and using 441s as uh, room mics, and they sounded really cool. Wow. They're very directional and got only you know, the sound bouncing off of the opposite wall. Um, so I would always experiment with those until I found something that really f felt like the snare drum was like having that bark in the room where it's just, blah, you know, um, really lighting up the, the room. Um, and then ultimately there would be an additional pair of room mics. Um, and so at Barefoot, it end, you know, I have a reverb chamber at, at Barefoot, which... Uh, I added a door uh, from the main sound room right out of right outside of um, or right next to my favorite spot to put the drums. So you could open that door and the sound of the live drums being played would just pour directly into the chamber. And I have a couple mics up for that. And that would be tracks 13, 14. So right there it is. There you go. That is that is the most geekery I've ever had outside of the Q&A session. But that's awesome. <laughs> I can't believe I remembered all that. Well, I, mean, I can't I, believe you could get that many microphones around the kick and snare. Like, that's insane. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's, it was pretty stupid. Um, Just physically but, getting them in there. I can yeah. see why you'd go to the, the, you know, the lapel mic instead of trying to get yet another microphone in front of that kick drum. Yeah, yeah. There's a, there's a cool thing that happens. I mean, you, you, you do end up causing... For every mic you add, you know, you get another perspective, but, you know, and so you get this other perspective, but you also complicate the phasing every time you add another microphone. And so there's always a trade off there. But, you know, especially for the kick drum, I've never really been satisfied just putting one mic anywhere like near the inside of a kick drum and having something that feels anything like what I want a kick drum to sound like. It just... It always has sounded just like a, a clicking sound with some low end attached to it that doesn't sound anything like the thing that I was just hitting in the room. You know? Right. And um, and so having all of those microphones around the kick drum and being able to manipulate them would create this sort of illusion of the space that's around the drum. And particularly like the batter side kick drum would get distortion and a lot of compression on it. And it creates this decay on the attack of the drum that... Um, it just has this air to it, you know, that makes it so it doesn't just sound like click. Right. And it's just also glue between the click and the blooming low end, which takes a second. Yeah, so. yeah. Yeah, for sure. And actually, you know, there was a certain point where that microphone that I um, mentioned, which was a room mic specifically for the kick drum, um, I realized at a certain point that... Um, that effect of having the high frequencies start the sound and then have it descend into the lower frequencies is a very satisfying effect. You know, it's been, you know, scientifically designed now by, you know, all of these electronic kick drum samples, which are all designed to bend down in pitch, you know, like right. the 909, the 808, all of those things go, you know, and that was, I didn't realize it back then, but that's really what I was I was doing was getting a low frequency element that was further from the drum so I could delay the low frequencies from the initial attack of the drum. And it's so fat satisfying. It's just, it makes the kick drum go, you know, right. And feels great. You know, when it's all in lined up in time, it just goes like, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and that's not the way you want your kick drum to sound. Bang, bang, nope. bang. That's not it. <laughs> Nope. Um, look, I am painfully aware of the time here already, and I'm what I'm thinking. Let, let's see what we get to. Let's see what we get to. Because I mean, there there are definitely there are a million other records we should talk about, but l l let's see how we go. Because we have to spend time on your theory of consoles, undertone. Like, there's sure, that yeah. whole side of your existence that we can't just like, oh yeah, and you made some gear. Because that's right. a that's a big topic. All right, but let's let's move on. I'm going to skip. Well, do I skip Maroon Five? Like, can't really skip uh, Maroon Five. Sure. I mean, I you know I didn't. I had a sort of a smaller role than that in in that stuff than other projects I've worked on because I did like I don't know three or four songs with them. Um, you know, so I was just part of a bunch a group of people that that all helped make that or 
second record, you know, what it was. And, um, but it was cool. It was an amazing experience and awesome. And some, some of it came out really cool and it was great. All right, great. Well, moving on. <laughs> <laughs> Let's... But I'm, I'm, I'm happy to talk about whatever. whatever well, no, I think, uh, um, I mean, I'm sure there's stuff about the Good Charlotte record that's very different, but you've already said like that process was very much the same as the Taking Back Sunday record. So unless there's something really specific about that, I mean, obviously it's a big record for them and it's a, it's a great record, but if the process of it's the same, because there, I mean, I've skipped right over Nickel Creek, which is like this outlier kind of in the, in between all these mm -hmm. rock records yes. too, which you might want to talk about, but I definitely want to spend a little bit of time talking about that Slash record. Oh sure, yeah, the one with all the different uh, singers on. Yeah, the first one that I did. Yeah, yeah, that that was such a cool experience. Um, you know, I when I got um, the call that you know there was some interest in having me involved with it, um, and heard about what it was and who the you know possible contributors were going to be, I was like, man, this this would just be amazing to be able to you know work with all these people that are you know even beyond Slash that are just like these iconic, super influential heroes, you know, that I've just been, and, you know, were part of what made me think, I, I want to do rock things, you know, like <laughs> that, that's where, that's where I really want to be, you know, it'd be amazing to actually, you know, work with folks like that. And um, I got the call and uh, scheduled um, a time to meet with Slash and, and talk to him about the project. And, um, we met at Jerry's Deli in Studio City, <laughs> and um, and you, you know, I you just have no idea. Yeah, you know, I'd never met Slash before, and he had such an infamous reputation that that precedes him, you know. And so you have no idea what to expect when you meet with somebody like that. What is what is this guy going to be like? You know, it's like, is it going to be this guy that tried to? you know, inject Jack Jan Daniels into his veins and like, you know, like he's done so much crazy stuff. He just put this biography out where he revealed all of this nutball stuff, you know, that had happened and gone on and, you know, with all the craziness with Guns and Roses. And, um, and so, you know, finally went to Jerry's Deli and sat down and, and uh, waited for him to show up. And he walked in, you know, just with a baseball cap on and, came and sat down and was just like the nicest, friendliest, actually kind of shy guy you'll ever meet. You know, he was, he's just an absolute sweetheart of a human being, really wonderful. And, um, you know, all of that, you know, crazy debauchery and stories and stuff, I'm, I, I'm quite sure they all did happen, but it's, you know, I think there's a lot of um, um, artists that have, do have kind of like split personalities and there's a, you know, there's a version of themselves that they save for the stage and is, is part of that. And then there's the, the, the version of themselves that's really available to their family and friends and, you know, potentially the people that they work with. And, um, and it was cool to be able to get to know that, that person, you know, that's, that's really set aside for the people that he's close to, you know. And, um, and so, you know, we had a great meeting and um, ended up going down the road of making this record. What'd you eat, I, by the way? Oh, man, I don't even I remember. Bet, no. Really? Yeah, I don't. Okay, um, fair enough. Moving on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, and so, you know, I think the way he's always talked about it when he was, you know, looking for people to work, work with, what he has said is that he knew this record was going to be very, very diverse. And he looked at the records that I'd made and felt like I had done a lot of diverse stuff and that I would be able to lean in whatever direction was going to be appropriate for different singers and stuff. So that was part of why he thought I would be good for the project. So, um, so we dove in and started doing it and it was just an amazing experience. Like he is such a musical dude and exactly like what I described with Jimi Hendrix, he's just a guy that loves to play guitar and loves music and always has a guitar in his hands and is always playing. And, you know, his instincts for a writing and arranging music is so strong. I, it's just like I haven't seen it that strong, you know, in many people where the way these songs were put together is he would write music with no awareness of 
melodies, lyrics, vocals, anything. He just writes riffs and sections and would arrange out a song and then think, ah, oh, man, this would probably be cool for, for you know, Chester. Um, and uh, dude from, uh, who sadly has passed away now. Um, I, of course, I've pulled up the one singer's name and I can't remember the name of his band, which is a ginormous well, band. Chester from Lincoln Park. Yes, there you yeah, go. Thank yeah, you. Chester Bennington, yeah. Yeah, Chester Bennington. And um, and so, and then he would send the song either to him or to Ozzy or to Iggy Pop or, or to Lemmy. Like this, Lemmy, like all of these amazing people. And I would say with very, very, very few exceptions, the singers would just write lyrics and melodies to what he sent them without changing it at all. You wow. know, maybe a tiny little adjustment on the length of a verse here or there or something. But that was it because the arrangements flowed, had such a, an amazing musical and dynamic arc to them. They were just easy to write to. Like, <laughs> and all the singers commented on it. They, they were totally blown away by That's it. That's amazing. So you were sending, like, you would track the versions that he would write as the album versions, or these are just quick demos, and then these you would quick, do the album version? Quick demos. And, and most of the quick demos he did um, with another guy that he was working with. A lot of the demos, this was already sort of in the works when I got involved. And I was being, I was being you know, brought in to start actually transitioning into making the, the record, right, you know, right. recording these tracks for real. And, um, and so... Uh, so a lot of the singers had already been selected and already written vocals and they had already collaborated and all that stuff. And so I had demos with vocals on them and stuff and, and that, you know, had already, already happened. So it was amazing to see that part of it and then ultimately, you know, get into tracking these things for real. And so as much as we could, we would have the singer come into the studio when it was being tracked so it could all happen together. Great. You know, Slash, you know, grew up making records in the 80s. And, you know, that's just how it's done to him, you know. And he was always, he was also really wanted to record on tape machines. Again, it's just how it's done. It's always worked for him, you know. Sounded good on Appetite. I don't see why we have to do it any different than that, you know. Yeah. I, don't, I, don't, I don't understand these computer things and I don't care about them. I just want to do it the way it's always worked for me, you know. And, um, and so, you know, we uh we would have the singer come in and track their song basically in a day and so it was just it was so cool to do that whole experience um with each of the people that ended up coming in um you know the uh the song i, I don't know why i'm so bad at pulling up names when i actually need to to remember <laughs> them um well by the sword is the one that you put on your playlist yes exactly and so um wolf mother singer you with the name i don't know that i'm not gonna get that name <laughs> it's not gonna happen why why would i why would i forget his name uh, it's his not name. mark will <laughs> i don't know he'll text me or something i'm just the worst person in the world hold on let me try and just uh stop being the worst person in the world okay well, um Andrew Stockdale. God. Yes. How hard is that? And you know what? I think I actually even have that in my notes because I, I wrote it down from when you put it on your list. Yeah, I got it down at the bottom, but I just refused to help you out he there. He has your name. How could I, I do no. <sighs> I'm just the worst. Okay. But like, you know, um, yeah, having Andrew come in and, you know, be in the studio when it's tracked. And he ended up playing like a 12 string guitar live with the band while we were tracking and singing his scratch vocals, you know, some of which, but he, you know, he was totally into doing it live as well. And so those vocals were totally keepable. We set it up so, you know, we could keep any of the live stuff that we liked, some of which, you know, we did keep and did some punches and had a, had a live vocal. And, um, you know, it was, it was just an amazing experience. And, and Slash was so game, you know, to, do whatever it was that I wanted. My setup was so bonkers at the time. I had this like EMI TGI series console that I'd borrowed from John Bryan. Um, you know, he just had it laying around. Yeah, you know. <laughs> and uh, because I was between consoles, I had gotten rid of my 88R and was in the process of building a custom, you know, the custom undertone console. And so I was just sort of filling in between it. And um, so we tracked through that console and tracked all the basics onto a Scully 16 track tape machine. And, you know, and we, we hired great 
players. So Josh again came in and played drums, and um, and uh, we had um, um, oh man, me with the the names. Uh, yeah, we had a, a rhythm section for the whole thing, and so okay. I'm just I I just I owe it to them to not be such an idiot. Um, what is his name? Okay, it'll come back to me at some point. Um, and so they 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 were the rhythm section for for all of it, and um, and there was just you know there's a bunch of really amazing different experiences across the whole thing. There's one one point when Duff came in and played bass on a song. It was super fun to to hear that. Um, there's one where uh, yeah, it was actually both Duff and Izzy came in and played on a song. Wow. And when you heard that thing happen, like Izzy's rhythm guitar playing panned opposite slashes playing, like the way those two things add up, it was just like, there's the thing. That's the, that, that's the thing. <laughs> it, it, uh, the thing on that appetite on the record, that thing. It, it was so incredible. It was so many amazing moments like that. And um, you know, their original drummer, um, that played, you know, in GNR that played on the Appetite record, you know, anybody that had sort of followed all of that, you know, he really struggled with, with addiction and went through a bunch of really, really difficult stuff. And, um, there was one song that we had him come in and play on. It was a song that was done with, uh, with Alice Cooper. And, and so I got to be there in the room in the moment when he came in and had a reunion with Slash. They hadn't seen each other in years. And, wow. you know, it was a, a very, very emotional moment, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, and just him being able to play drums with Slash again, you know, was just incredible to witness. He was just like on cloud nine, you know, it, another really amazing moment. And, um, and it's, I think one of the things for me, um, through all of my years of making records that has always been important to me is like, I, I, I want to try and make records that are as good as I can possibly make them, how, whatever that is. But at the same time, I want it to be, um, a really, really wonderful experience for me and the people that I'm working with, you right. know, like that's really important to me, especially at that time, because it's all I did. I would literally go to the studio 14, 15 hours a day, six days a week. I only took one day off a week. And that day I just, you know, mostly just slept the whole day. And, um, and so like, if the record making wasn't enjoyable, like if, if that was being difficult and sucking, my life would be difficult and sucking because it was my entire life. Like there's just there right. was nothing else that, was really like giving me that 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 fulfillment in life, and so it was really important to me to have it be, you know, a really really fulfilling experience for everybody that's in the room, and and there there would be times where I would make sacrifices or compromises on things that maybe it could make something a little bit better in one way or the other, but if it was going to compromise the band's unity or you know somehow cause um sort of you know an interrelational problem within the band you know in the long run like they have to get along you know beyond this record and continue as a band and you know it's okay if you know i'll you know, I would take the blame for certain things to just preserve the unity of the band at times. Right. Uh, because I'm not a member of the band and it's okay for somebody to be pissed off at me for a little bit or whatever. And we'll either work it out or not or whatever, but you know, they'll move on and they, they need to stay solid as a band and, you know, they'll work with me again or not, or other people or who knows, you know, but like, you know, um, I've always been very sensitive to that. And there were so many moments on that record that were so incredible in that way of, you know, people connecting or reuniting or having these incredible, you know, transformative moments where you get to work with somebody that's just so iconic, you know, like 
recording Iggy Pop, you know, doing vocals was just completely surreal in every way. Pushing the talk back button and going, okay, that was cool, Iggy. Can, do you think we can try one more time? You know, <laughs> like, is this really happening? You know, it was incredible. And like, uh, yeah, talking to him about lyrics, you know, I suggested a lyric change on on the song that he brought in. And uh, and he was so cool about it. He was totally game. He was like, yeah, you know, there was a, there was a line in the song where he sings about peeing on the ground. And uh, and I thought, man, I mean, are you sure that doesn't cheapen the song a little bit? You know, is there something else that you can say, you know? And he's like, oh, yeah, you know, there's always something else you can try. And so he had another lyric. And as soon as we all heard, heard it, we was like, no, it's way better with the peeing on the right. ground. <laughs> he was totally right. <laughs> it was way more Iggy, you know. Yeah, yeah, he is usually completely right. So yeah. it's a really, it's a really interesting thing you're talking about because there are some producers who are, you know, make fantastic records and are going for that same elevated, not perfection in a, it's on a grid way, but like the best version of the record, but don't take into account kind of the experience of the band in the same way. And right. I'm I'm wondering they do like, they have a more at all cost approach. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like I mean, you know, they're, they're I love the records he makes, but there are a million stories about Beinhorn. Just like no, we are going to listen to microphone cables for four days because it will be better if we do. And it doesn't right. matter that that's like not what people want to do. But that's right. a different thing. But so how do you reconcile that with like with Taking Back Sunday? Was it that you were showing them? what record making can be in this particular way so even though it was painstaking and at first they were maybe not enjoying it but it was still this journey that they appreciated later on and so it i'm just curious how, how that ties into what you were just talking about yeah and, and they've talked about it a lot you know um uh i've you know, I, on my YouTube channel, there was an episode where I had um, Adam and Mark on and we talked about it a bit. And and they they very openly talk about how challenging it was to, you know, hear the phrase one more time, you know, <laughs> as many times as I threw it at them. And um, but, you know, ultimately, they they really did enjoy the experience. And, right. You know, I think people and you know there's all, all kinds of different folks and i sort of you know i'm sort of feeling my way through it as as we're working on you know and, and with the reactions that i get and some people are, are are not very tolerant of it and and you know and so i i adjust my approach to accommodate you know really the the you know the endurance of of the artist that i'm working with and try and figure out where that line is and um but you know i think um, they ultimately really appreciated being pushed, even right. though at times, in the moment, it's extremely frustrating. It right. can be really aggravating. But know? it's also, it's the way you present things. And, you know, some people, I've talked about this before, like some singers think it's funny if you say, well, that sucked, let's do it again. And other singers, you've just destroyed them for the whole day. Yeah. Like you just, you gotta I'm, know what you can say and to whom. Yes, I'm extremely careful about the language I use with artists. It's re, you know, and like I would ha I would have to be on my second or third record to ever let the word sucks come out of my <laughs> mouth in front of an artist. Like so we have that kind of relationship where they are they are 100% sure that I have all the confidence in the world and with them before I would ever even use a word like that yeah. in the room ever. Yeah. I mean, and even and even as a joke, you know, like even as a joke, let's do one that doesn't suck as much or, you know, but right. yeah, it's you're taking an enormous risk um, joking. And it's something that I don't really do a lot. And so, you know, when when I'm it's just not a risk that I'm willing to, that I really want to take as I'm very careful about how I want to do that, because if you have a misunderstood joke in a room that makes somebody really feel uncomfortable or shit on you could totally ruin your relationship with that artist and it's that project's over like it can it can happen that fast yeah as soon as they you lose that trust and confidence with the artist it's fucking over <laughs> you're not doing anything yeah and so i'm super careful about that and you know when i'm trying to you know push things in a way that i think is going to elevate what we're what we're trying to achieve i never talk about what's not working ever like that's the worst way to try and encourage somebody to move forward and and keep you know pushing for something 
you always talk about what it could be, you right. know? And, you know, I, I learned that early on and it's like, you never start like, ah, man, I don't know about this verse. I just don't, it's just not cool. You know, like now you have a singer that's completely insecure and bummed out and fucking, you know, doesn't want to work on music anymore. Right. But if you start off going like, you know what, there's a cool, there's a cool thing that you could do here. And they're like, Ooh, what's that? And then you, you can suggest something, you know, it makes all the difference in the world. Yeah all the difference yeah and i think the other important part of this just for the the younger record makers out there mm -hmm. is that it sometimes you'll try to equate people being comfortable in the studio with not pushing them and not necessarily working that hard and that's the opposite of what you're talking about because it's not mm -hmm. settling like you said you would settle for something rather than break up the band but not yeah. if it was going to be a terrible record. Like, well, then that song's just not going to happen. We'll put it aside, whatever. But it's, right. it's yeah, hard you know, work. Everybody, yeah, everybody's going to draw those lines somewhere else, you know, wherever they think it is appropriate. And, you know, and I try and sort of prepare people, you know, managing expectations is also a really important part of the process, you know. And so people know what to expect when when this process starts and we're in there and we're slogging through things and so they aren't surprised by stuff as it comes up and so i always tell bands early on like when we meet and talk about the possibility of working on a record um that the worst thing i could do is show up and go that's great cool awesome yeah love that love that too wow <laughs> another great idea you know <laughs> and just say yes to everything that's that's not what i'm here to do you know like if you want somebody to just show up and tell you everything's already great then hire somebody else to do that yeah most you know? people's moms would probably come in and say it's all great so exactly hire your mom you know and so you know, i brace them for the reality that like my job is to come here and address the things that could be better you know, and if I'm not doing that, I'm not doing my job. And so yeah. you just got to be ready for it, you know. So I think people need to go listen to By the Sword um, immediately when this finishes, because it's, first of all, it's a great sounding track, but it's also got this thing where the intro, and I I've listened, I should have listened to it again today before this, because I wrote a couple things down. But from what I remember, the intro is basically an acoustic intro before the band comes in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the acoustics are like crushed in a super cool way and like really compressed. And then when the band comes in, it's like you can't hear any compression anywhere near it. It just explodes. And right. it's a really fantastic um, contrast, not just in level, because it's not about that, but just in like the sonic worlds they live in. You're not expecting the drums to sound as open as they do when they come in. And it's just amazing. Mm. Yeah, cool. I, um, you know, that was a really fun song to mix just because the, the, those dynamic tr transitions were written into the song. So it was easy to make them happen, you know. And, um, and uh, you know, oddly enough, I was always sort of like um, there were things and mixing that record was was a little tough for me in some ways. Just my setup, like I said, I was in transition and there was some things like that just made it a little harder for me to really like hear the mid range accurately and stuff. And so there's things about that mix that I know when I listen back to it now that could have been better, but on that record in general, just because of where slash had come from and I knew what he wanted to hear and the artists that he's working with that all had, you know, come from an era where things were not compressed into oblivion. And, you know, I had, definitely done my share of exploring the depths of compression <laughs> you know like I, i've tried to figure out how much compression can i actually put on everything you know right. like it's you know it's it, it's good it's pretty much good so I, it must be good on everything all the time all with as much as possible right <laughs> and so i've i've definitely i definitely done that and and you know explored that and so this was really, you know, one of the one of the times where I was really starting to back away from that and listening to earlier records, you know, listening to like these Black Sabbath records and even an album like Appetite, you know, where it's like there's not a lot of compression on these records and they feel incredible. They're just bigger sounding, 
Like yeah. there's something really, really cool about this. And if you get the EQ just right, it fucking works, man. It's so good. And so I, I you know, I was trying to trying to do that. And so Well, you did. Yeah. And it was, the, it was very intentional. It's cool that you you actually, you know, that it was perceivable on the other end. Definitely. And the drum recording approach was pretty different. This was not the lots and lots of microphones thing, was it? No. This was very few, right? Yeah, this was much more stripped down. And uh, for, for people that are interested, there is an episode on my YouTube channel yeah. specifically about this song. And so you can dive as deep as you want into it um, on that episode. But I'll, I'll, I'll run through it now. So this was, um, I believe, only six mics maybe on the drums. There's um, a snare drum mic, a kick drum mic. This is one of the rare times where I got away with just doing one kick drum mic because it was, I don't know, three or four feet away from the drum. It was uh, a U67 just out in front of the, the kick drum. And so it got an, a, a beautiful, natural, you know, perspective on the kick drum. And also the other, you know, it ended up being like a cool sort of mono drum kit mic for other things because it was far enough away that it was picking up a cool so kind of roomy snare drum and other things. So it just worked, you know. And then I was doing the my version of the Glenn John Z sort of over under -y thing, you know. And um, so that was just my C12As that were doing the over under thing. And so, yeah, so it was um, one, two, three, four. And then there was an additional just room mono room mic um, that I ended up gating. So it would open up more just when the snare drum hits and just make the snare drum a little more explosive sounding. And that was it. That's the whole drum sound. Right. And it's awesome. It sounds gigantic. It's yeah. really good. Yeah, part of that, you know, like all that was recorded directly to a Scully 16 track tape machine. And, you know, I, I think there's fewer and fewer people out there that really can appreciate what those things do. And when you record something onto one of those tape machines, it comes back sounding nothing like what <laughs> you sent to it. Yes. But it's way, way, way better. It's an incredible. If you know story. what to expect, yes. I think yeah. it, you have to have the experience of recording to tape. Like you need to really, really know what tape does to get away with yeah. it. Yeah. Like if you're, if you're on input on that machine or just monitoring everything directly through the console and get all your settings and EQ and all of that stuff and balances and then print it to tape and listen back, it'll be all wrong. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so there's, you know, it just takes a few rounds for me. I can anticipate it a, a certain amount, but then, you know, I'll record a bit and listen to it and go, okay, this, I need to add a little more high end, you know, so to adjust for what the tape machine is doing or add a little lower end or whatever, make some adjustments, push the level and try and get it in that sweet spot on the tape machine where it's just making everything thick. And the Scully does this thing where it's like, it makes things both brighter and less harsh at the same time somehow. It's just right. like the most magical thing, you know? So I still I still love it that I'm, I'm keeping, um, yeah, four four tape machines from Barefoot. I'm, I'm going to sell my Studer 800, which is an amazing machine. It's wonderful, but it's actually kind of like they got too good at making tape machines at that right. point. For me. And so I'm keeping my MM1200, the Scully 16 track. The MM1200 can do 16 or 24. And I have an ATR 102 um, half inch for for mix down and then i'm keeping um an old like ampex you know 350 series two track and then i, I do also have a studer j37 but that's out in topanga if it hasn't burned up yet man so. let's just hope it hasn't yeah um, <laughs> <laughs> i'll find out tomorrow yeah um man all right look i want to distill the record part of your career down to just like one more artist because okay. you, you married her so yeah. let's <laughs> so let's talk a little bit oh, about Grace artist. Potter. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, that was probably the most um significant record making experience of my life because it changed everything in my life, you know. And it started the same as all the other ones. My manager going, Hey, there's this uh singer named Grace Potter, and you know, we're thinking it might be cool for making a record with her. <laughs> and uh that was in twenty fourteen. Uh, when I got that call and, you know, I immediately went on it and I, I actually hadn't heard her before, you know, she came up in the jam band scene, which was just not really a world of music that I'd really explored a lot. You know, as soon as you see band names like 
twiddle and, <laughs> you know, pigeons playing ping pong. I just move on to the next band, <laughs> you know? Um, and so, or the string cheese incident, you know, those were things that didn't compel me to hit play. And, uh, but I did hit play on Grace Potter and the Nocturnals and was totally blown away by just her singing and the overall aesthetic of that band. They're just an incredible band. Yeah. You know? And, and in particular, you can just tell immediately, like, um, she is a gifted singer in a way that just doesn't, you just don't come across a lot. And so I heard it on the records, you know, that she had made leading up to it. And now, you know, having made two full records with her and, you know, made a baby with her and go on tour with her and all this stuff still every time she steps in front of a microphone it fucking blows my mind i still can't believe what she does like it's unfucking real you know she's gifted it it's she's the kind of person that the word gifted was invented for it's right. like she's never ever had to try to sing ever <laughs> and to a point where it's actually kind of a problem. Like as when I've talked about, you know, how artists have a different sort of threshold for how much they'll work on something. Hers is extraordinarily low, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like if she, if it doesn't come out of her in the first few tries, it's like, eh, this is just not something I should sing. You know? Right. Because like for her singing stuff uh, in key for starters and in a way that just sounds compelling and emotional and, you know, um, musical, just all, that's already, already, it's just all there, you know? And, um, and she does things that still, I just don't know how they happen. Like she's tapped into something that I don't understand. You know, we'll go, we end up at a piano bar and, um, you know, she'll decide to just sing a song with the piano player and sing my funny Valentine, which I've never, I've never heard that song played in our, environment ever once in the seven years that I've been around her never knew that she knew would know that song she says I don't know that I've ever really sung that song before but she's heard it at some point and just sings the whole thing like out of nowhere like how does that happen I don't, it's fucking crazy you know wow and yeah it's really unbelievable and I've watched you know she and she she doesn't know any music theory or anything you know she you know, she knows at a certain point and sometimes she'll pretend that she doesn't just for effect, you know, but she knows what the strings on the guitar are. And, you know, she can, you know, generally know like, OK, that's probably an F sharp there, you know, uh, on a guitar. Um, but in general, doesn't really know, you know, any music theory. It's never bothered to learn it because she doesn't have to. Yeah. She, she knows all of these notes already. Like they're already all inside of her and she doesn't ever sing wrong notes ever. As soon as she starts hearing a chord cadence, she already knows what all of the notes are that should be sung. They right. just come out. And it's not just the obvious ones. It's all of them. All yeah. of them. Yeah. And then she'll sing a second harmony and a third harmony and a fourth harmony if you want. Just first try every time. It's crazy. <laughs> Man. And, and so, you know, it was, a, it was a really cool experience just getting to know her. And, you know, we met and talked. She talks about coming into barefoot um, recording and was the first time that we actually met just a quick sort of, hello, nice to meet you. This is my place. You know, this is where we'd be recording kind of thing. When she came in there, I was like soldering stuff under my console and stuff, you know, not wearing any shoes and just looked like a complete disaster, you know? And, um, and you know, that was, there was something about that for her that, that just, that clicked for her that like, you know, this guy clearly doesn't care about anything but making great records, you know? Right. And that's the person I want to work with, you know? And, uh, and it was, it was really true, you know, like I just, I, I bought my clothes at Orchard Supply Hardware, you know, like that. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> cause I you were there for something else. Yeah. Yeah. Just don't care. Didn't care. You know, she buys clothes for me now. So it looks like good, I care. good. That's yeah. a plus. And, <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, <clears throat> um, uh, you know, so we, we ended up diving into making this record and, you know, I thought this was going to be a super easy one, just like 
this is a great band. They're amazing live. She's obviously super talented, amazing voice, great singer. Um, so, you know, we'll have a bunch of songs. We'll pick the best ones, do some pre-production, make a record. Great. This will be easy, you know. Boy, did that not happen. Like, not <laughs> even close. It was the furthest thing from that. And so the next thing was the band was doing pre-production in Joshua Tree. They had already sort of set up to do that. And, uh, and so I just came out to hang out for a day and meet the rest of the band and kind of get a sense of what they were pulling together for songs and stuff. And they could kind of meet me and see how they feel about me. And I could throw around a couple ideas in the room like, hey, you know, maybe a different kick drum pattern there or something, you know, whatever. And um, uh, so I went and did that and that that went well. And um, everybody seemed to be reasonably comfortable with me. Um, uh, I think there was there was one band member that was generally not, you know, into the idea of having producers at all. So he was probably not <laughs> right into it, you know, but there's always one of those in the band, I think. And um, and so we ended up, you know, um, signing on to do the record. And uh, so the next thing that happens, they sent, you know, a ton of demos, all the, all the stuff that they came up with Joshua Tree and a bunch of her own demos that she would do like in garage band or voice memos or whatever, sent me like you know, 40 audio files or something. And um, I, I started digging through all the stuff and sort of starting, you know, organize the songs. And I always do, you know, the songs in, in the sort of like, I categorize them as for sure's, maybes, and probably nots, you know? And again, like I never say, this is a no, you right. know, or whatever. Like, um, and, uh, and so then, she decided to send a bunch of the demos to the record company and uh, she sent them like 25 of these, these files and they were pretty rough. Like you could tell that there's, there's good ideas in there and, and you could definitely shape this in a record. It definitely needed some, some work and the, the songs needed to be sort of congealed a little better and all of those things that pre-production are for. And she sent the files in and the record company was like, we don't think you're ready to start making a record. Um, <laughs> these, uh, you know, this collection of songs is not going to start this process. Like that's this is not going to happen. And so then we we're like, what are we going to do? <laughs> you know, like we we have we can't start. Like we scheduled to do this starting now. So now what do we do? And so we decided let's let's try and get some more songs together um, and try and finish some of these ideas a little better. And, um, and so it was just me, Grace and Matt, the drummer, um, who was also her husband um, at the time. And so we worked on four or five songs, something like that. And, and I tried to just have them sound a little more finished um, get them together a little better and uh, and we sent those in and then everybody went oh my god this is the greatest this is gonna be incredible and blah 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 this song is a grand slam home run and blah 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 all that stuff um because finally they were delivered something that sounded more like you know a focused idea yeah like a record because they don't it's i think for people who make records who are used to hearing what it's going to be in their head they don't realize how difficult a thing that is for most people yeah. Yeah. And one, one of the other things that happened was like, you know, um, the grace with her band, the nocturnals, like there was that sort of, you know, that usual, you know, push and pull within a band dynamic where there are, you know, different people that are have opinions about what the sound of the band should be and what kind of guitar parts should be played and all that stuff was going on that sort of added up to be that sort of grace and the nocturnal sound and on this record when this whole thing happened because this was like the beginning of it being it was supposed to be the beginning of it being more democratic where she invited the whole band to come in let's do this songwriting thing together in the room and that was the thing that was given to the label and i think two things happened at the same time she was signed to hollywood records she invited the band to be more part of the the writing process and to form these songs together and things were changing at her label and she had a new, they had a new sort of, you know, whatever head of creative, you know, at the label 
whose instincts were way, way, way in a different place. And so when this more, you know, this very organic sort of jammy band stuff came his way, he was like, this is not even remotely close to anything we're interested in putting out as a record. And so when that reality, you know, um, was presented, you know, Grace has had always had this idea like, you know, I mean, I like all kinds of music. I don't have to make all this sort of like throwback, jammy, you know, bluesy rock stuff that, you know, has always been sort of like the the thing that this band has been, you know, going for. I, I'm, you know, I, I like all kinds of music. I don't have to just do that, you know. I love singing all kinds of shit, you know. And so she had a collection of songs that were just more kind of upbeat and groovy and dancey. And it's like, why don't we just yeah. go in that direction more? And, you know, I've wanted to try that anyways. Let's just do that. And so that's that's what we tapped into when we did these other songs. And that's why I got the, re the reaction that it did. Right. So, you know, they were songs that were definitely going to appeal more to, you know, the people that... And the record I mixed for, which I, I think was their second, I don't know, second or third, but it was in that direction too. It was um, uh, Mark Batson. Is that, am I? Remembering? Oh, right. Yes. Yeah, so you mixed the, the, the self-titled. Yeah. yeah the, and so, and that was definitely sort of shaped in that way to, it made sense for Hollywood records. It was, you know, shorter songs right. and, and that kind of thing. So and she'd you know been down that like, path before. Poor Grace and, and that band, like they had been through so much, you know, trying to make records. It, it had always been a difficult process for that band because that record that you mixed, do you know what happened before that record no. was made with Batson? That entire album was recorded, recorded with T-Bone Burnett. T-Bone Burnett. All the same songs, most of the same songs recorded with T-Bone, which seems like an obvious, amazing pairing for Grace. Absolutely. Holly Records said, no, we're not putting this out and shelved it. Yeah. <laughs> Can you wow. believe that shit? I was like, really? Oh, my God. You know? Yeah. And the, the addition to the uh, debit column from that must have been yeah. quite extraordinary, too. Yeah. And so, like, you know, they'd been through rounds of that before. And so, you know, so this was just kind of another round of it. And so, you know, so we went down this path and, and, you know, all of the powers that be, you know, responded very positively to the stuff that, that Grace and Matt and I came up with. And, um, and so we took those demos, you know, the, these five or six songs, and then we sent them to the band. And I think we maybe even did some more as well. So it would be a more complete connection because, you know, so now like, the bass player and the two guitar players were sort of out of the loop. And, you know, Grace and I were sort of filling in, playing guitar on the demos and stuff. And so it was time to send it to the band. And so we sent the music off to the band um, because the idea was it was still going to be a band project. We just needed to get it so we could start it. You yeah. Know? And, um, and so, you know, have the band come in and then we'll just, you know, have the whole band play these ideas. And <laughs> we sent the stuff off to the band and it was just chirp chirp just crickets <laughs> like no response for like three days oh <laughs> it was, man it was unbelievable and and grace was just like god damn it man you know and so we were you know and particularly me you know like i was stuck you know in the middle of like these three you know forces there's like the record company that basically you know wants her to be whatever you know um pick your disney singer du jour miley cyrus or whatever you know that's what they really wanted grace to be was something like that yeah you know? and her band that wants to still sound like neil young <laughs> you know and grace who now is like yeah let's do some dance music you know like it was th three completely different universes you know and so that's how that album started. It was really, really difficult. And so we got in there with the, with the band and, you know, the band was just not into it. They were super not into it. And it was just like dragging anvils up a hill, you know, and um, with, 
with, with the exception of, of Matt, he was always very, very supportive of, of Grace and whatever direction she wanted to run in. And, um, and there was, you know, one big blowout, you know, in the midst of trying to track it where people were just so just the spirits were so low in the room you know and grace is trying to be excited about these songs and trying to get them going and people are just kind of like uh, you know <laughs> just like no enthusiasm at all and there was one song a song called delirious where um we added a whole like jammy crazy psychedelic end section just so the band would have a place where they could be creative and play and jam and whatever and they were just not even into that, you know? They was like, it was just even having it attached to the rest of the song. They were just like, you know, I don't get this. And and there was a there was a really intense moment where Grace was basically like, you know, if you guys don't want to be here, just fucking leave, you know? Like, I can hire people that will want to actually be a, play these songs, you know? And it's like, I, I can't do this with people that are just like miserable and right. the, the worst. You know? Right. And um, it was intense. It was super intense. And, um, but, you know, we ended up just sort of grinding through it and got to the end of it. And, you know, even when the record was all done, it was still potentially going to be, um, you know, a uh, great part of the Nocturnals record. And um, she and Matt took off um, to try and make a final decision if it, if it should really be a solo record or if it should still have the band because the band had played on it, you know. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and ultimately they decided, yeah, let's make this a solo record. And, um, and so things just sort of unraveled from there, you know, with, with the band. Um, and I, I don't want to get too much into no, 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 no. personal stuff of that, but um, no, but, it, but it, uh, it happens a lot where, you know, you, cause obviously the band is a band, but grace is the artist in a way. And certainly from where the label is standing, grace is the artist and always has been, which has got to be really tough for the band in the first place. But the concept yeah. of what is the band versus what is the record we're making right now? And sometimes you cannot reconcile those two things. Yeah, yeah. This was definitely one of those moments. And, you know, and, you know, I, I'm i always just trying to, like, get to a goal line and and doing my best to try and make it as enjoyable for people as possible, you know. But, you know, that was that was pretty, pretty impossible. People, you know, they just didn't want to be a part of it. It's know? rough, and I think it, it's... It is something that happens, a, not a lot, I don't know, but I mean, I can think of other examples of bands with extremely talented and versatile female singers that the labels really, they couldn't care less whether the band comes along for the ride or not. Like, they really see it as the singer's the artist and she could do something else and mm -hmm. like, oh, she's the next Debbie Harry, she's the next Janis Joplin. Like, well, hold on a second, like, no there is something there's another dimension to it but it's yeah yeah it's brutal though it, yeah it's, absolutely it's really brutal. tough it, it, those 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 moments you know uh and those transitions can be extremely difficult and you know um i think ultimately you know the that that record that was made midnight was a really cool record a, a, a very creative you know um moment for for grace where she really got to stretch out and try anything and everything that she ever wanted to yeah. try and it ended up being really tough you know for her and her audience because it was definitely a departure from where she'd come from it was the most you know extreme departure from where she'd come from and um and you know you find a lot that when artists try and make a move like that that the people that are sort of the least inclined to be able to really appreciate it are her existing fans because they already have an expectation for what they want from her. Yeah. And they, they hear what it's not more than what it is, you know? And, um, and so th that record was, it was tough, you know, with her fans, like they were really just like, you know, what are you doing? And uh, there was certainly a lot of people that, enjoy it because they enjoy her and understand that she is a multi-dimensional artist and you know 
um, are happy to go wherever she wants to take them, you know, with her voice and stuff. And those songs still have tons of amazing, you know, emotion and meaning and messages for people to really sink their teeth into, you know, sink their hearts into. Um, but some people just can't get past the fact that like, that doesn't sound like Neil Young. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, <laughs> I, you I know, Josh, it, Josh had it right in a way, you know, fuck yeah. the fans in a way. But look, it's like Metallica fans think they haven't done anything good since Ride the Lightning. Right. So yeah. like it, there is a, there's always the version of the band that you fell in love with. And it's always right. whatever the first record w that you heard was and it's hard. Yeah. Like, I, I feel like there are very few bands that can take everybody with them. And I'm, they, like you think Kid A mm -hmm. took a long time for all the Radiohead rock fans to say, oh, okay, we'll come along on this ride. Like, yeah, yeah. it wasn't simple. And they're one of the few bands to sort of pull it off in the long term. But it's it's really, really tough. Yeah, yeah, it's very hard. You know, I, I think U2 you, you has been one of the most successful. Like they've been able to reinvent themselves in these ways, but still hold on to sort of really key elements of of their identity and bring that with them and you know reconstruct it in all these really cool ways you know i just i've loved the way that band has evolved you know and i think one of the reasons and i'm just this is completely just because i was listening to an interview um because edge has uh I, I don't know what it's for so it's a webcast or a podcast or a something or other where he interviews people and he was he was interviewing someone and they were in a band that had like most bands will have one instrument that is a revolving door and everybody else is there the whole time. Right. <laughs> and he was saying about and I hadn't really thought about it. U2 has never even for a second flirted with having other members and since they were all too young to drive. Yeah. Like, you That's know, amazing. Yeah. Their parents were driving them to and from the studio on the first record and it's never changed. So for them to go somewhere, it's almost, I don't know if they get more of a pass, but it's like there's something that's somehow easier when they change direction because it's all the same dudes. It's not like, well, we got a new yeah. guitar player and now we're doing something else or whatever. And it's it's just tough. And it's tough for artists too because most artists aren't one note, you know? They've got yeah. more stuff to say and love other music and want to do things. And Yeah, imagine being Weezer. <laughs> <laughs> fucking hell I, that that yeah I, I feel for for rivers man it's just it's just insane like he's such a talented creative guy and he wants to try all kinds of different stuff and yeah fans fucking crucify him for it it's yeah unbelievable and it's like do you really want me to make the fucking sweater song for the rest of my life you know it's like is that really <laughs> there are a lot of people who do yeah, and, and I don't the, think and, they and it's realize a resounding yes from his fans. yeah, and they don't realize that like what's so compelling about those early records is not that they are the quirky heavy thing; it's that they're pop songs. That's right. what it is, and that's Rivers' love is pop songs, and then yeah. trying to find ways to do them that are like what the hell just happened. But right, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. crazy. So well, look, I, I'm very aware of the time here. You say you got to get out in like 15 minutes, right? Yeah, let's start some questions because okay. I just heard you know, Mama and... and, and okay, so we're going to do Q&A, but I am going to force you, we're going to do a part three that is going to be nothing. Okay. We're not going to talk about records. We're going to okay. talk about <laughs> the equipment that you build and your theory okay, about sure. consoles. So we'll come back and, and do that if that's cool. I, I would love to. Yeah. All right, awesome. So let's get Mark in here for a little Q&A. And if the, the chat isn't happy about all the technical geekery that you went into, then <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Because usually, like, well, how come you didn't talk more about recording drums? Like, well, we did. <laughs> <laughs> we sure did. Yeah. Well, well yeah, well, let's, let's see what comes up. I mean, I didn't, I didn't talk about... Uh... Talked about the microphones and the drums, but I didn't talk about preamps. And no, right. no. I, I want to talk about it all in the context of you deciding you had to build a console. Like, oh, okay, sure. You know what yeah. I mean? Because yeah, I, that, I think yeah. that's all got to be of a piece. And then also your robotic mic stand and the drumbrella okay. and <laughs> your yeah. your ability to just like take all the stuff that everybody has always wanted to have in their studios and actually build it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that'll yeah. be part three. It's 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 either you know i think um yeah 
I'm I'm either fearless or or really dumb. I'm either brave or or dumb. I don't know. It's one of the two. <laughs> you can be both. <laughs> yeah, yeah, com combination of both. No, no, I don't think dumb comes into it at all, at all. So, all right, so we'll do a geekery part three. But in the meantime, rapid fire Q and A. Yeah, yeah, cool. I'm excited to hear about the uh, hear more about the robot. I I saw um, your episode on Pensado's place years and years ago. Yeah. And my amazing dad, who's also an electrical mechanical engineer, um, actually built one for me. Oh, it beautiful. With remotes and everything. Yeah, he yeah. went back and watched the episode amazing. and he built it for me. So look, and I got to say one thing about that Pensado's Place interview that just is so funny to me is at one point, one of you says to the other about, can you even imagine EQ in a kick drum with a Neve? Ha, 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 ha. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like, and we'll talk about that next time because I okay, just yeah. I think that's hilarious because of course okay, for a awesome. lot of people Neve on a kick drum it's all I need and you're like what the right. fuck are you talking about no <laughs> fucking way you can do that <laughs> yeah different strokes man yeah all right Mark you have the floor okay all right so for everybody watching on YouTube we take our questions from the Crowdcast room which has a ask a question section where people submit their questions and then upload each other's questions and we start with the most upvoted question. Uh, the first one is from Gav Murray, and he says, Eric has hinted about doing some UA plugins, uh, undertone audio, not universal, if he could find a developer that he thinks could do it. Update on this, please. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yeah, you know, um, the, the whole endeavor to build originally uh, a console and then ultimately uh, the rack mount gear and the unfair child and all that stuff. And I've got some, some new products coming out hopefully this year that I'm super excited about um, all hardware stuff. Um, it all only happened because I met this amazing human being named Larry Jasper and I call him the smartest man in the universe because he's the most brilliant audio circuit designer I'd ever encountered. I'd met a lot of techs and a lot of people that build audio stuff and fix it and whatever and he was just on another level and it gave me the confidence to dive in and and do this crazy thing of building a console because i knew with his help we could get there you know and i just i haven't met the larry jasper of designing plugins yet when i meet that person i will totally do it and i know they're out there and i, I could probably start you know, actually chasing them down. But, you know, like Larry sort of f just sort of dropped out of the sky in front of me when I needed somebody to help me fix a tape machine. And, um, and so I'll probably have to be more proactive with the, with the, um, the plugin thing, but, but that's really what I need is the, is the person to collaborate with. And I have some very specific ideas that, that I want to do, um, that I think are, are, are missing out there in the plugin world, uh, that I need, that I'm, I'm looking for. And um, hopefully that'll happen. I'd love to do it. All right. Awesome. Cool. There it is. Uh, that was our most upvoted question. So there's clearly a demand. Okay. Uh, Marcelo Suarez is our next question. And he says, you said lately that you love recording drums with one mic. And I love that approach. Would you still do this for some of the heavier music that you work on? Um, pr that would be pretty hard to do, uh, with the, the really aggressive stuff. It's, it is doable. Um, but it's one of those things where the drummer has to play exactly perfectly. Um, mm -hmm. you know, the reason that you end up putting, you know, 15, 16, 17 microphones on a drum set when I was describing that, um, third eye blind, all American rejects kind of thing is that, you know, the drummer is playing somewhat uh, haphazardly, just bashing cymbals in order to capture this energy on the drum set. But the balance between the cymbals and the drums, the you know the kick drum versus the snare drum, all that stuff can get out of balance. And you need to have those close mics in order to put things into balance. And um, you just you run out of options for doing that with one microphone. And so. I think it's I I always believe that anything's doable, but it would that would be really hard. And, yeah, I mean uh, even even Bonham, I mean he got mad when it was more than three. But yeah, yeah, you know Glenn was putting three mics on him. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, uh, for, you know, I, I would guess even more later on. I hear more than than three later on. I think there was a snare drum I got snuck in there by the time of Houses in the Holy. Right, could have been, could have been. But yeah. I, I know really early on, like for for John, it was like you're going to change my balance, and he was incredibly aware of the balance he was playing with right. and didn't want it yeah. fucked with. It's unquestionably that for one which is glenn you know two has some some other people some other people involved and then uh and you can still hear it on four because the drum sound in the left and right sides you can hear that it is two individual microphones you know that is yeah. the well you know on levy breaks there's a, a 160 on each side of the drum kit there it is it's very very audible you know, the left and right sides sound wildly different. Yeah. <laughs> you got you got to do that, that isolation of those two sides to hear it. Nice. Awesome. All right, moving on. Quick fire. All right. <laughs> we'll get them Gav all in. has another question in here. Uh, can Eric talk about his prime number drum dimension theory and its origins? Sure. Yeah. Um, I, I got, I got really interested in um, prime numbers and, and how they, can you know benefit acoustics when i was building some diffusers um these uh you know there's this classic sort of schroeder style um diffuser design where um there's all these uh vertical slats that are at different levels and there's a pattern to it and the pattern is based on prime numbers and when i researched it and discovered like oh the prime numbers are avoiding overlapping harmonics in the harmonic series that's why that they do that that make that totally makes sense and the same thing made sense to me for for drum shells that um if you have drum shells that are either square dimensions because there's a whole line of drums that are like 10 by 10 12 by 12 13 by 13 both dimensions are are reinforcing the same harmonics and the harmonics become much more audible in the drum and in the case of the drums it's this sort of pingy sort of basketball overtone that you hear um like in the floor toms and stuff that's where it becomes more audible and um and so i you know th those types of drums i had noticed were a little less forgiving with being tuned to different pitches. Um, I like to tune the the drum set to the key of the song. And so that it meant that this rack tom needs to be exactly a C and the, fl the, the floor tom needs to be a G. And I want the snare drum to be a B, you know, like I had specific things that I wanted. And, and so um, it became very, very difficult, you know, um, to get certain drums to do that. And part of it was because there were certain overtones that were being exaggerated by the dimensions of the shell that were really sort of pulling the tuning of the drum into one specific sweet spot and it didn't want to be tuned to other places. And so that was the idea behind the, the, the prime number drums. And there's been a lot of really interesting debate about this. And I think, Anybody that dives into prime numbers has the same realization at a certain point. I had it when I was doing the diffusers. I was figuring out, um, you know, the dimensions of the depths of the different um, uh, slats of the diffuser using inches. And then I realized at a certain point, wait a minute, if I convert all these to centimeters, these aren't prime numbers anymore. <laughs> What's going on here? <laughs> you know, and... <clears throat> and so, and there's people that have commented on that about the drums, you know, if you convert the dimensions to, to centimeters, they're not, they're not prime anymore. And that's totally true. Um, but what's important is that they are prime relative to each other. And, um, and that's what uh, allows it to avoid having the, the harmonic series um, overlap in some way and re reinforce a particular overtone, you know, out of balance with the others. So, mm -hmm. so yeah. Right. Interesting. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Cool. I'm, uh, I'm going to put a link in the chat to um, 
sugar percussion, which is where your signature kit is. Yeah, that's right. So sugar percussion, there's a guy named Jeff Schallenberger that's amazing um, drum builder. Um, he grew up in Palo Alto. We didn't know each other when we were kids, but, um, you know, reached out and uh, and I, 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 I approached him with the ideas like, would you be interested in trying this? I, I'm just I'm just curious to see what it does. And he was totally game and made the first kit, which is still, you know, the kit that I record with in, in my at my home in Topanga. And um, so, yeah, yeah, he built them. They're, they're really cool. I, I, I think they really do work pretty wonderfully. You know, they're, they're very forgiving and being able to tune to different keys and, and uh, tune all over the place. And I love them. Awesome. OK, here's a, uh, a quick one. This is from Cam Shash. And he asks, are you keeping any of the UTA consoles? Yeah, the, um, maybe he's seen what's been going on recently. You know, I've been um, basically scaling down my collection of gear. I'm taking all of my very most favorite stuff, and I'm taking that with me to Vermont. This process is starting tomorrow, by the way. I'm flying to California to see if I still have a house that hasn't burned down in Topanga and um, grabbing the stuff that I have there. And then I'm going to go to Barefoot and I'm going to pack up every single thing in that building. And um, what's happening is, you know, uh, I built those consoles. Um, I still believe, you know, uh, for what I want from um, an analog console, it's, it's the best console ever built because I built it to be exactly what I want. Um, and if I was going to continue to work on analog consoles, I would. Those are the only ones I would use. Um, there's a few things about them that just no other console does. They don't. Nothing. Nobody ever went there. But what's happened is um, I am just. Uh, I'm too curious of a human being, and uh, as much as I love those consoles, the whole experience of recording and how music and technology marry together to create this thing, this sound, this collection of sounds and words and melodies and that come out of speakers that make people feel things, how the, the technology, the equipment and, you know, the, the musicians and instruments combine together is extremely fascinating to me. And that is a journey that is never going to stop for me. And so I'm designing a hybrid mixing system that I'm super duper duper excited about. That is going to be how I mix records for mix and record records for the next 10 years until I get bored of that. And then I'll design something else. <laughs> Great. It's, it's never going to stop. You know, it's like, it doesn't matter how good it is. I've, I've done it, you know? And so it's, it's time to try something else, you know? Awesome. Okay. Uh, how are you doing? Can you, we get one more? Do one yeah, let's, more? We'll, yeah. we'll go, we'll go to five o'clock. Or, oh no, okay. it's, it is five o'clock. Yeah. Let's do, let's do one Got more. eight seconds. All right. Okay. One more. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We'll do one uh, more. So our next one is from Peter and Peter says, I'd be really interested if Eric has some tips for recording cleaner surfy guitars. So, um, they are bright and thick, but not too harsh, particularly Things like Jaguars and Jagmasters, or sorry, Jazzmasters that are really peaky and spiky. Mic choice and placement, compression. Thanks for a great session. <laughs> and you got four seconds. Yeah. Four seconds. Okay. Yeah. We'll take a little longer than that. Um, yeah. Uh, man, I love me some surf guitar. And th there's there's a few cool, cool ways to approach this. So um, earlier on with Greg Camp, I was doing more close miking and then maybe blending in room mics. Um, for surf guitar stuff and with that uh and i know what you mean about jaguars jazz masters um they have this real spiky thing in the high mid range and that's one of the things you know uh, andrew you were just joking about using neve eqs which are amazing but they are not particularly surgical and so i got in the habit of using things like these orban um, parametric eqs that can get extremely tight bandwidths, you know, um, Q settings. And so I can just, you know, surgically remove those really piercing overtones. And so a lot of the stuff that you hear um, on those um, Smash Mouth records, you know, anywhere that where I was doing that kind of surf guitar stuff, I can guarantee you that I'm in there with, 
you know, a super narrow bandwidth EQ just tweezing out something around, you know, 2.7K or something like that, you know, um, to try and put that stuff in, in a better balance so it doesn't overwhelm the actual musical part of the sound. Um, but uh, I've used all kinds of stuff, you know. You can use a 57, it shows up brighter, but then, you know, then I do more subtractive EQ moves where I take out the harsh stuff um, and then you're just left with kind of this cool, open, shimmery high end. Um, if you want something darker, you have used lots of ribbon mics for surf guitar. It can be great. There's one really beautiful sound I did with Greg Camp that was just a Royer SF-12 stereo ribbon mic that was way far away from the amps. And we had two amps that were set up um, as a stereo pair in the room. And it's just this amazing, you know, panoramic surf guitar sound. And more recently, um, I've just in general, I've stopped putting microphones close to the speakers on guitars. I'm just not going to do that anymore <laughs> for <laughs> the kind of guitars that I'm recording, which is a lot more surf guitar stuff. Um, and I find as soon as I get the microphone away from the speaker cabinet, it's got about a hundred million times more personality and character when you hear how that sound is developing in the room and, um, uh, you know, able to react with the room. It just becomes more of a unique thing. Instead of just hearing the sound of that guitar and that amp, now you're hearing that guitar, that amp in that room. And it's a whole other thing. Some other people don't have your room. And so it'll be a whole different version of it. And, and then I'll just sort of, you know, like if it ends up too dark because the mic's really far away, you know, just add a shit ton of high end with eq <laughs> it's there you just got to bring it out you know um and so i've been really loving that i've done some stuff recently where the microphone is literally just like up at the ceiling and not a very particularly big big room you know it's maybe a room that's only like 16 by 20 and just put the mic so it's not even pointed anywhere at the amp at all you get this amazing sound with unbelievable character that sounds more like somebody like link ray or something you know and doesn't right. sound like this really sort of you know, clinical kind of sterile one millimeter from your face, super pristine thing, you know, that's just become much less interesting to me now and how I'm approaching things now. So that's sort of my general, the the arc, of my, my journey with surf guitar there. Nice. Awesome. Yeah. Well, on that note, we should let you get out of here and I will be in touch to schedule a part three. But most of all, good luck on your trip to LA. Hope everything is good cool, there. Thank you. And yeah. let me know when you're back, um, and we'll we'll set this up and just have a geek yeah. fest for part three because we got to we'll do. We'll find that. another time. You know, I'm mostly going to be hanging out in in Vermont uh, through the summer, and uh, there's going to be a bunch of shows going on. Mama's starting to tour again, so um, she'll we'll be jumping off playing shows. But you Great. know, I'll be around. We'll we'll do another one. We'll do it. Awesome, man. Yeah. All right. Well, cool. thank you so much, and awesome. I'll stick around with Mark and let people know what's coming up next week and all that kind of stuff. But all right. There you go. Oh, cool. Thank Thanks, you. For awesome. Thank you so much, right. Eric. And talk to you soon. All right. Bye. Bye. All right. Bye. <laughs> oh, what a good that dude. Was fine. Fucking yeah. hell. Um, so for the kids at home who want to know what's coming up. So next week is it's part two month. I think I've already mentioned that a million times. Uh, so part two with Ed Stasium next week. And then part two with Trina Shoemaker the week after, which is the 31st. And then... I think we're going to take June off. So everyone can go have a summer and try and avoid COVID. And then as soon as we all lock down again in August, because that'll happen, then we'll, well, July. We'll be back in July, I'm sure. Anyway, yeah. whatever. That's the deal. So we got two more part twos and then uh, a little time off. And I think that's all I got. You got that's anything, it. Mark? I think that's pretty much all I got. Yeah, keep an eye out for more uh, Between Two Shares. Oh yeah, Some stuff happening there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean to all kinds of people. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> it's it, awesome. it's it's my thing. All right. Well, now Mark and I are going to wave awkwardly, and I'll mute and go to the thanks screen because that's what we do.